Yeah, this was this was a bust for you, Albany. And Tracy came out of the backfield, and as you said, nobody picked him up. They had trips to the near side and one on the far side, and they were so preoccupied with those receivers, nobody even covered Trace Snead out of the backfield. Fordham again sniffing points, already leading 7 0. A pitch for Snead. And he cannot beat on that cutback Ori Jean Charles. Ori Jean Charles. Yeah, then I've been watching the more at the last few plays to see if he keeps looking at that hand and he whatever pain he was in, I'm not gonna say it subsided, but he is not looking down at that hand in the last three or four plays. So hopefully for Fordham fans, he's all right and good to go for the rest of this one. He is wiping it with a towel a lot, but I feel like that's his normal kind of pre play between play behavior. Another catch for MJ Wright, stepping out of bounds near the 20 yard line. That was a really good wrap by MJ Wright just to come back to the sideline. Quarterback has to play the deep ball and when Wright planted his foot in the ground to come back, that corner had no chance. Really, really good play there by MJ Wright. This is an Albany defense that got gouged by the UNH run game a week ago. And right now, dealing with one of the more high-powered passing attacks in FCS. Over the middle, Kuko Suez has to go through his hands. Maybe tried to run before he made the catch. Third down coming for Fordham. Yeah, and that's what pressure can do, right? Tim DeMora had a body in his face, had to check that down. That throw was kind of off schedule. He got that out sooner than he would have liked. Yeah. And he didn't really get the chance to read the defense, just had to pop that out to Coco Suez. Wasn't a terribly accurate throw, and Coco Suez had to go through his hands. And pardon me, that was third down, so this is now fourth and four, and it becomes a 39-yard, 38-yard attempt for Brandon Peskin. Snap and hold are good. Peskin's kick is away, and it's good as well. Season long for him, officially 38, and it is 10-0 Fordham. Getting late in the first quarter here of the Rams home opener. You Albany Benz doesn't break. That's the good news for them. Welcome back to Jack Coffee Field. Andrew Bogish and Jimmy Sullivan with you. Our entire crew happy to be back bringing Fordham football to you. This is the home opener for the Rams, their third game of the season. 2-0, up to number 21 in the FCS coaches poll. You already looking for its first win and its first lead of this young season and already in a 10-0 hole on a short kickoff. Taken at the 15-yard line. 
by one of the up men for Albany. And some decent field position. That's Thomas Greeny there, star tight end, getting that return. And they'll take the decent starting position for this second possession after a three and out that only went backwards because of a couple of sacks. Yeah, and this offense has to start stringing together first downs. They've got to stay on the field. Otherwise, this defense is just going to get absolutely gassed by this Fordham offense. That was their problem a week ago. Lopsided time of possession with New Hampshire that really wore them down in the fourth quarter. Poffenberger's first completion is to Quinn's and Noble, number 17. Talking to Greg Gattuso, the Albany head coach during the week. 35, 37, 38 minutes time of possession. That's the area where you can really affect the way the game goes, and that's what he wants his guys to try and get to today. It's good for the way they want to play offense, and most importantly for this one, it's keeping Fordham on the sideline offensively. Yeah, they, they simply run there for a yard or two. You know, th this offense, I thought, played a pretty good second half last week against New Hampshire. They were able to string drives together, but again, like you said, when you're going off the field three and out and your defense has to go back out there, it's deflating psychologically, but it's also, it, it tires you out physically, and you don't want that against this Fordham offense with the no huddle, the tempo, and the weapons they have. Third and four for you, Albany, just across their own 30. Poffenberger with three wide receivers near side, throwing in that direction for Jackson Parker. It's incomplete. Garrett Williams in coverage. Albany wondering why that's not pass interference since Williams never turned around for the ball. But no flag for that, and a second you Albany punt. Yeah, and I don't know what happened on the offensive line there, but it looked like the right tackle for you Albany, Will Murata, it looked like he just fell down at the snap. And, you know, they've had issues in pass protection. They've had issues blocking in general. And, and you just, you know, when, when you're struggling to protect the quarterback and you're struggling to uh, open up running, running lanes, it just feels like it goes from bad to worse, and that happened there. Pastula, a couple of steps, and then a punt. Thornton directs every other ram away from it, and a good Great Danes bounce inside the 20-yard line. You feel like, especially for you, Albany, this is a really important juncture in this game. You know, Fordham scored on both of their possessions. You, Albany, doesn't have a first down yet. And you made the point about they haven't had a lead this season. You know, when you're a young team and you're starting to mesh, you really need to learn how to win. And they haven't even completed the first step of how to manage a lead and keep a lead. So it's been a really tough start for uh, you, Albany, this season, and it hasn't gotten any better today. Yeah, and you know, the hard thing is to, how do you process the Baylor game? It's the mm. Baylor game in Waco for a CAA team. So you focus just on last week at UNH, and they were behind the eight ball right away. Some mistakes. As you said, they were better on offense later in the beginning, and they were really hoping for a better start today. Now, Somewhat of a win for their defense last time, keeping form to just a field goal, but the three and outs on offense, and now right back on the field for this defense, this is a, a dangerous spot for them late first quarter. Because 17 nothing might seem yeah. like a really big hole. Running again is Fordham, and it's Luffridge keeping his feet. 35-yard line, moving the chains. Trace needs a really accomplished runner for Fordham. He's a man, too. He's, been in school since 2016, initially at Rutgers, now here at Fordham. Luffridge is young, similar, maybe a little bit quicker. Nice change of pace and a good note of the future for Fordham as well, running the football. DeKeese Carter's got a catch and another Ram first down. And this running back combination, as you were saying, Andrew, usually when you have running back combinations, you have one big back and one kind of speed back. But these guys are pretty similar, as you said. Both weigh about the same, they both run similarly, and Luffert has actually learned quite a lot from his need. Here he is again, into a brick wall this time, and finally down he goes. Dylan Kelly was the one that dragged Luffridge down. For him, hoping to get healthy as well at that running back spot, because so far, through two games and a quarter, only Sneed and Luffridge have carried the football. Trey Wilson, a senior, ran for almost 600 yards last year 
is trying to get healthy. Taj Barnes, Jack Kaiser, a freshman from, from New York, in the mix as well. Felton on the screen. Keeps the drive going and again moves the chains. And this for them off the road to run pick plays. They love to get their receivers downfield so they can either after the pick or get in a position to block when the receiver catches the ball. And that was an example. The Keith Carter got out ahead of felt, created the block, gave him enough room for the first down. Final minute first quarter here, Jack Coffee Field. Fordham driving, already leading 10 0. Trey Sneed meets Jackson Ambush and others in the hole, and down he goes. Jackson Ambush. U Albany's got Jackson Ambush at linebacker and Kavon Angry in the secondary. <laughs> Those are good <laughs> defensive names. Quick snap to the outside. Two receivers over there. The farthest one makes the catch. That's Cole Thornton. Dan DeMarie, that's a long throw. Coming from the left hash, throws it back across the field. A little bit of a dangerous throw, but Thornton able to make the catch. Now you've got another third and short, and I think from here, probably four down territory given the kicking situation. Albany making some subs, trying to keep as fresh as possible. Sometimes they'll even change their entire D-line in one fell swoop. And everybody can get a break here because Fordham Let's the first quarter run out, and a good first quarter for them. Looking for their first 3-0 start since 2013. Their first possession ended in the end zone, then a field goal and some good defense. It's 10-0 for them after one in the Bronx.
It is quarter number two here at Fordham. The number 21 of the FCS coaches pull Rams, a 10-0 lead with the football, but it's third and two as this second quarter begins. And they'll go on the ground with Trey Snead, and there are all sorts of great dames around him. He's going to be short of the marker. Yeah, Albany did a really good job there. Gap discipline, uh, devoting a lot of resources to the run. But that play call tells you what Fordham's thinking here on fourth down. They run it on third and short. They don't get it. Now it's fourth down. They're going to keep the offense on the field. Elijah Hills, A.J. Simon among the Albany defenders getting up from that gang tackle. Calling this four, fourth and two for the Rams. Sneed again looking for it's going to be close and he's going to be short. Progression for the Great Dane defense. A TD, then just a field goal, and now a fourth down stop to get the ball back. Absolutely huge play by this defense, and they did a really good job. Fordham, it seemed like ran almost the same play twice to Sneed up the middle, and they were all ready for it, and it, it took a lot of effort and getting through gaps, but. A great stop, as you said, for you, Albany. Now this offense has to start holding up their end of the bargain and string a nice drive together. They have run six plays, negative nine yards, eaten up by two long sacks on their first drive. Poffenbarger, some confusion, finally gives it off. And they end up with a couple, four yards on first down with Sibley. And again, when you have a lot of new players, sometimes these things happen. They're all learning a new system. and. They kind of fake the end around there, and Poffenbarger, I'm not sure if he knew, was he going to hand it off, keep it, pitch it? A lot of confusion there, and they're actually lucky to get what they got on that run. Sibley is in the backfield with Poffenbarger, and again, Sibley, four-year member of the Pitt Panthers, but they changed offensive schemes. He didn't really fit what they did anymore, but he fits what you Albany wants to do, a physical straight ahead runner, and here he is, still on his feet, breaking tackles across midfield. Natani Drotti got him down for Fordham. And, and this is what he does, he's low to the ground, he's hard to get down, and when he gets going in a straight line, he can get a little bit of speed, and he can break off runs like that. And now Albany, you Albany starting to put it together. And this is a Fordham defense that allowed 390 rushing yards, 11.1 yards per carry last week in their win at Monmouth. No room to run this time. Parker Spillers, Matt Jaworski, and Drotty again combined for the stop at the line of scrimmage. Yeah, and they were on him well before he got to the line of scrimmage. And this Fordham defense, as you said, almost 400 yards allowed last week. That will not cut it in any context. And it was a lot of missed tackles, a lot of bad gap discipline, but we've seen some of that be corrected today. Fordham gave up touchdowns last week of 60, 80, and 95 yards. Back on the ground, Sibley burrowing forward, maybe for a yard. And now you've got third and nine, and this is a spot where I think Reese Poffenbarger can create a little bit with his legs. Can he get outside the pocket? Can he make a throw on the run? What does Albany cook up here on what is a third and nine, kind of a low percentage proposition, but they've got trips up here. We'll see what they come up with. They're thinking pass. Poffenbarger into traffic. The catch is made. That's Greeny, his favorite target from a week ago forcing his way inside the 30, and Albany has got its first drive going into the afternoon. And whenever you see Tripp's receivers up top, you always want to look at that one receiver on the bottom because he's got pretty much half the field to himself. Poffenbarger with a pretty good throw. Greeny with a nice catch, a little bit behind him. And Albany moves the change. they got to get some points on this drive to kind of stabilize things a little bit. At the Fordham 26-yard line now, early moment, second quarter, down 10-0. Poffenberger lofting it and a nice twisting catch out of bounds inside the 10 goes Julian Hicks. Really good throw there from Poffenberger and we saw this a lot last week. Monmouth pretty much killed Fordham with back shoulder fades over and over again. The play is so hard to defend. I thought that was pretty decent coverage but they're able to complete it because that receiver can get turned around much quicker 
and he was able to get the ball. Fordham thought their guys were good in coverage yeah. and being near the play, but then just didn't make the play at the end to break up the passes. First and goal for Albany, Poffenbarger. And the flag flies, Stephen Williams in coverage. Little post for Roy Alexander, and Williams had a arm around him. Yeah, and Williams was beat, and when you're in that situation, you have to decide, okay, do I let him go? Do I take the penalty? Williams pretty much concedes the penalty there. And now you all have been knocking on the door and kind of changing this game. Bill McKeever, our referee, first time we've heard his voice this afternoon, first flag on either, other, either side, excuse me. So it's first and goal from the two for Albany. A lot oh, of big bodies out, out there. Here, yeah. Now the shift under center. Sibley on the handoff. Looking for a hole and there is not one on this play. Yeah, and they, they changed the formation there quite a bit and I just don't know what it achieves when you when you move them under center and then you move the guys out wide, especially on a play like that. Everybody's committed to stop the run anyway. Whether it's in pistol or under center, I don't think that changes much defensively and Fordham able to easily make that stop. And we've got a Fordham timeout. The first call by either team in this opening half with Albany at the goal line looking for its first points of the afternoon. They just stopped Fordham on fourth down, moving down the field and thinking touchdown. After the Fordham timeout, it's second and goal from the two for U Albany. We got a little wildcat look here with Todd Sibley. Sibley, the running back, takes the direct snap. He scored like this last week, and he's in the end zone again. Here it appears. U Albany says he's in. The sideline says he's in, but the line judges say no, he's not. He's just shy of the goal line. Yeah, and they like this Wildcat look, and then they go with a tackle run simply to try to find that gap. Now you got third and goal. It's got to be two plays here. Same formation. The quarterback to the bottom of your screen. Now the motion for Sibley. Stood up again, but he squeezes through. It looked like it's a touchdown. Fordham got him before the goal line, but Sibley slithered off a body reach through traffic and he gets six. 
Yeah, that was a tough run. And, you know, when you go in a Wildcat, I always found the problem with Wildcat was that you had to have somebody who was at least a threat to throw it to make the defense think about that. But, man, that was just everybody in the box, our best against your best, and Todd Sibley able to push through a couple of tacklers and get a huge score for you, Albany. John Opalco for the extra points. And Opalco puts it through. So the Great Danes turn the fourth down stop on defense into seven points, and they're right back into this one. A good start for Fordham, but a good answer here from the Great Danes. It ends with Sibley falling across the goal line for six. Welcome back to Jack Coffey Field on a beautiful Saturday afternoon. You Albany feeling better about itself now. A defensive stop and a touchdown to make this a 10-7 Fordham lead. A little more than five minutes gone by in quarter number two. The Great Danes 0-2 on the year. Have already played one conference game, losing last weekend at home to New Hampshire. Coming down from the state capital into the Bronx to deal with these Rams. Opalco kicks off. Coco Sulis on a bounce from the 10. Coco Sulis returns kicks. He's Tim DeMorat's favorite target. He also makes tackles on special teams on coverage units. He barely leaves the field for Fordham. As the offense comes back out, they've gone touchdown, field goal, and then Stopped twice on third and fourth short to give the ball back a moment ago. Yeah, and it looks like only one deep safety here. Watch for them to take a shot. On the rollout, he's looking deep, and right open is Coco Sulis, but it's out of his reach. You called it perfectly. They saw it. Coco Sulis had no one near him. He could have backpedaled into the end zone but it's just off his fingertips. Yeah, and, and it's a touchdown if he hits this throw. If you've ever played the NCAA football video game, there's a, a play just like this. I believe it's called play action inverted veer, and Coco Sulis ran it deep down the field. I'm sure that's not what they call it, but it was wide open, and DeMorat just overthrown. You know, as good as Fordham was last week on offense, 52 points, over 700 yards of offense, Tim DeMora talked about the points they left on the field. A couple of missed throws. He had an interception. That was a missed throw a moment ago. He recovers with the fastball to MJ Wright for this first down. 
20 on that connection. Back on the ground, Luffridge. Missler had him high, Kelly had him low for UAlbany. And UAlbany's been playing a lot of one safety high, so those deep shots, those deep throws, they're gonna be there for Fordham. Tim DeMora just has to be able to connect with his receivers. Yeah, and part of that is there's so many receivers, but UAlbany also really respects Fordham's run game as well. MJ Wright, another catch right down below us. Isaac Duffy wrestles him out of bounds. I've been really impressed with MJ Wright and his route running in this game. He's able to create separation, use those quick bursts, change of direction, change of speed. I've been really impressed by him, the way he's been able to run his routes today. He's alone, bottom of the screen, number two in maroon for Fordham. A senior from Freehold, New Jersey. Was on a Red Bank Catholic high school team with multiple Division I players. Luffridge. Scored through the hole, but then Ambush wraps him up. But after he picks up the first down for the Rams. Yeah, Lucas Portes, the left guard, did a really nice job creating a seal that allowed Lovebridge to bounce outside, get enough for that first down. And now this Fordham offense starting to get back in a rhythm. Cody Johnson, number 78, is the center on this drive for Fordham. Gio Patente started there. Johnson, though, is a junior from Texas, came to Fordham as an O-lineman, played defensive line last year and now back on the O-line and playing some pretty good snaps at center. Luffridge sidestepping Great Danes inside the 40 with a flag behind this. And right on cue, Johnson's called for a hold to back Fordham up. That's almost like when you mentioned a kicker is <laughs> 11 for 11 and he misses. Yeah. You say, how Good about old this? announcer jinx. Right? How about this young man bouncing <laughs> back and forth, offense to defense, now playing well at center, and he's called for a hold. Oh, man. Yeah, he just uh, grabbed a hold of one of the nose tackles there and dragged him down. And now Fordham's got to dig out from behind the chains here. I think you're looking for five to seven yards here, maybe a short throw just to get some of those yards back. It is first and 20 after the penalty. Nice sliding catch, Carter coming back to DeMorat, almost back at the original line of scrimmage. And, and that's exactly what you're looking for, right? They got nine yards back out of the 10. Now they're, they're still behind schedule, but it's not undoable. Whereas, you know, if you're second and 20 or second and 18, that's a lot harder to come back from. Moore has got to get it away into traffic. He finds Carter again. He had a man in his face. There were three great Danes around Carter, but the connection is a Fordham first down. It's actually a really good throw by DeMora. It's low so his receiver can catch it without getting popped. And off his back foot without being able to set, that's a really nice job by Tim DeMora. Trey Sneed gets a carry on first down. Stays on his feet inside the 30. So Fordham moving again. Luffridge and Sneed each have seven carries. Luffridge just over 30 yards on the ground. Sneed just under it. Time for DeMorat. Came back over the middle of the field. It's Coco Sulis. And notice what Coco Sulis did there. Came back to the football. You know, a lot of times receivers will kind of just sit down, and that's where DBs are able to jump in and make picks. Coco Sulis out there helping out his quarterback as we have an injured Great Dane. It was one of the two in on the tackle. Can't see his number from here, but he got an immediate gulp of water from the trainer when they got to him. So we'll check on that when we come back.
after the injury. It was Larry Walker Jr. who walked off for you, Albany. Fordham on third and one, runs it. Luffridge reaching is going to be short. So the third and fourth down stops on the last drive, and now this one, that's three straight stops against the run in short yardage for Albany. Yeah, now you've got fourth and inches, and you have to decide, okay, we ran it last time. It didn't work. If I was calling the plays, I'd give Tim DeMore a chance to get this with his legs. We haven't really seen him get outside the pocket today, but I'd give some sort of read option and allow Tim DeMore to hit the edge and try to pick up that half a yard. Luffridge, the running back, four wide receivers on fourth and inches. It'll be DeMora, just like Jimmy said. Tim gets the first down and then just drops to safety at the 20. Yeah, see, the edges were really condensing down on that last run from Luffridge, and that's why there wasn't a lot of room. So you call a read option, and that allows not only your quarterback to get outside the pocket, but it also plants another seed in the defense's mind when you come in that formation that they have to set that edge, and that allows more room for your running backs. So you're two for two. You called out <laughs> that single safety set before for the deep post that could have been six with a better throw, and now you say quarterback keeper, and you get the first down. That's oh. a dangerous throw. That would throw it going basically in our sight line. There did not seem to be an open ram on that side of the field. Yeah, this uh, defense, Joe Bernard, the defensive coordinator, they watched the tape. They ran that play a lot against Monmouth. That little receiver screen with the receiver blocking downfield. They jumped it. Could have easily been a pick. I think that was Isaac Duffy that broke it up. So it's second down. Play fake over the middle, and he misses Coco Sulis. He was open. Yeah, and he just, he had him open the whole route, and that played to you, did that just seem a little out of rhythm? Demorak kind of looked at Coco Sulis, and I'm thinking, okay, ball comes out right now, and he waited another beat or two, and wound up missing the throw to Coco Sulis. And still wondering how that hand is. Early mm. in this game, he banged his right hand on somebody, something, on a release. Yeah, that's a good call, Andrew. I don't know if that's affecting the accuracy. We've seen a couple of less than stellar throws. Throwing on third down. He's got time. He's got an open receiver. They've got a touchdown. Garrett Cody, a little spin move. Left the defender behind him, and the Rams extend their lead. Great throw and catch. This starts with the offensive line. As a defense, you can't cover for that long, and Demorak kind of had his options. They were in a zone, and Demorak, totally clean pocket, was able to survey, look around, and then boom, Garrett Cody wide open for an easy throw and catch for the touchdown. But as a secondary, you can't cover for that long, and they got to start getting a little bit more pressure on Demorak, who had a great drive that last time out. Third touchdown catch of the season for Garrett Cody. The first two came in their opener at Wagner. The extra point is through, and Fordham answers the UAlbany touchdown with one of its own. So it's 17-7 Rams, four and a half to go here in quarter number one. The Great Danes got in the end zone their last time out. And we'll see if they can do it again when we come back to the Bronx.
Fordham's had the ball four times. They have scored three times, two touchdown passes from Tim DeMora. at this one a moment ago to Garrett Cody. Yeah, and this was a great route by Garrett Cody. They thought they had the zone covered and he just uh, crept in right behind it, wide open, no help over the top. That wheel route up the sideline, really good against that two safety high coverage. And Garrett Cody with an easy walk-in touchdown. Michael Bernard will kick off. Depth's been an issue so far this afternoon. This is a good one. Alexander lets it go into the end zone. And now the touchback for you Albany. So they'll have four and a half minutes, three timeouts to try to go back down the field. Their last timeout they got in the end zone. That was coming off a fourth down stop. Their first good extended drive of the afternoon. It ended with a Todd Sibley fall over the goal line for a touchdown. And this is where you start thinking about game management, clock management if you're Albany, The Great Danes are getting the ball out of halftime. So if you can get a touchdown here and not leave a lot of time on the clock, you have the opportunity to you know, get two in a row here, but you have to get this first one. And it starts right here with four and a half minutes to go. Poffenbarger, the freshman quarterback, Spring transfer, won the job over the summer and has played well through two weeks. Overshoots Zenoble. Nasir McNair was in coverage. They were connected. There are also flags back near the quarterback. Now, now did, they, did they pick up the other flag? No, I don't think Bill McKeever knew that flag was thrown because he has already announced the hole that he called against Albany. So if it's a holding and a pass interference, it'll just offset. Now the officials, they have their own intercom system. So Bill McKeever gets it all straight. He called the hold and made the call right away. Didn't hear the call from his assistants in his earpiece. And as Jimmy said, the penalty's offset. And we replay the down, we lose five seconds off the clock. Sibley coming left with room. Todd Sibley turns the corner down the sideline. Greenhagen's not going to get him. Sibley's in for a touchdown. 75 yards. Andrew Fordham's defense was totally discombobulated before this play. The safeties were trying to scramble. Mike Courtney was running to the other side from his deep safety spot. And Todd Sibley had nothing but green grass when he got to the second level. There should have been a safety or a linebacker, somebody there but the two Fordham safeties just completely miscommunicated and that left that part of the field wide open for Todd Sibley. Communication so important and this defense right now, a miscommunication and a big play for you, Albany. Oh, Palco's extra point is perfect and we are right back to a three point game. You were talking about clock management. <laughs> Long drive, points, get it right back to the third quarter and instead, they score in 16 seconds on another big play against this Fordham defense. Last week, three touchdowns of 60 yards or more, and now Sibley for 75. And, and what does that come down to, right, Andrew? You, it's gap discipline and it's finishing tackles. And we saw kind of two of those issues there for Fordham. Todd Sibley should not have had that much of a gap to run through. Now, credit to the U Albany offensive line. It was a great play by them. Everybody pulled in that direction, so they deserve a lot of credit. Don't get me wrong. But as a running back, when you see a gap like that, you're salivating, you're thinking, I need to hit this hole as fast as possible. And that was what we saw from Fordham last week, right? The Monmouth running backs had huge holes to run through. That's how you run for almost 400 yards on you know, not a ton of attempts for as many yards as they had. So again, this Fordham defense, they just have to fix the issues. And, and they don't have to be an elite defense with this offense. They just need to be able to get enough stops, get off the field and be kind of a middle of the road defense. But you know, they're kind of struggling right now. The kickoff from John Opalco after the 75 yard touchdown run from Todd Sibley and Albany follows up that good news with the mistake. The kickoff out of bounds from Opalco will give Fordham 
good starting field position as we say hello again from the top of Jack Coffee Field. Andrew Bogish and Jimmy Sullivan with you. Fordham has led this entire first half after scoring on its opening possession. It was 10 0, then it was 10 7, then it was 17 7. And a moment ago, Todd Sibley, basically untouched, ran for 75 yards to pull the Great Dames back within three. Tim DeMorat, already the program leader in career touchdown passes. He's got two more in this opening half. As the Rams come back on the field, there's pressure over the middle and another misconnect with Fotis Kokosoulis. 15 catches for him a week ago, but that's the third, maybe the fourth pass near him that ends up incomplete. I'm actually kind of willing to put this one on Coco Sulis, believe it or not. U Albany is playing his own, and Coco Sulis is supposed to kind of sit down. Now, it may well be a miss by DeMorat, but that ball is about where it's supposed to be given where the zone is. So it's probably a little bit on both of them, but that one may be a little bit more on receiver than quarterback. Last possession for Fordham, which did eventually end in a touchdown, could have ended in a touchdown earlier. Here's Coco Sulis with a catch and a broken tackle trying to strip him unsuccessfully, A.J. Missler. It's a good gain for now for Fordham, but it's a penalty and it's coming back. Yeah, somebody got tackled on the U Albany defensive line. I couldn't see who it was, but nevertheless, it's coming back. And again, Fordham behind the chains. This happened a couple times today. Now it's gonna be a second and 20. And look, with this offense, they can make up just about any deficit, uh, any yardage, they're that good but you don't want to consistently put yourself in these situations where you're having first and 20, second and 20, second and 15. And that's what's happening a little bit to this Fordham offense right now. Second and 20 after the hold. And now movement at the snap. Fordham had actually done a really good job coming into this game with penalties. They just had not been penalized uh, very often. Uh, this team, as a matter of fact, four penalties per game in their first two games. I'll definitely cut it, but it's not so much the penalties as when they happen and how they happen, and a couple of a couple of bad ones here for Fordham. Well, you've been good calling plays so far this first half. What do you got for second and 25? <laughs> I don't think there's much in the playbook for that. You could do this deep for Filton out of his reach. And on a play like that, to be totally honest, you're trying to get a flag. You're, you're, yes, you're trying to connect with Makai Felton downfield, but you're also trying to get a, a defensive back turned around and trying to get the penalty, which comes with an automatic first down. Now, obviously, third and 25, you know, your best bet here is a screen or a run, some kind of short pass to give your punter a little bit more room. Tim DeMora taking his time, a rarity. The play clock under 10 for Fordham. Trey Sneed leaves in motion. Quick hitter for Cody. And down he goes right away. Nice tackle by the linebacker, Dylan Kelly. I tell you what, this U Albany defense, they've been on the field a lot. They've done a pretty good job. You know, they, they had some issues last week where they couldn't get off the field, they couldn't get stops. They missed a lot of tackles. Greg Gattuso, when we talked about him during the week, he said, look, you know, we, we have to do a better job in that department, and they've done that today. They, they've done a good job tackling, and they've done a good job containing, and now they've got a chance with under three minutes to go to have a drive to maybe take the lead into the half. And they have forced a rarity, a punt by Fordham. This is Will Hazlitt, an Akron transfer. Jackson Parker, the receiver, takes it at his own 35-yard line and is down at the 45-yard line. So the Great Danes, they've got the ball, and they've got some momentum. They're playing defense, and they were just in the end zone within three points. A touchdown here would give them their first lead of the season, two and a half games old. And, and you like the competitiveness of this U Albany team coming in here for this game. Big crowd here at Fordham. And the thing I really like about this offense is when they can get the running game going. I think that's so important for this offense. They've got a mobile quarterback, a couple of really good running backs, and when they get that going, they're much more multi-dimensional. Reese Poffenbarger, their freshman quarterback, throwing to his right, and there's his tight end, Thomas Green. He out of bounds in Fordham territory. Just a really good play on first down. Little stick route from Greeny towards the sideline. 
they were playing kind of off coverage, so boom, there's a free nine yards right off the top, and now you've got second and one. Todd Sibley, who ran for the 75-yard touchdown last possession for you all, but he's not on the field for this one. Our first look at Jose Lopez, number 25 in the Great Danes' backfield. He and Poffenberger, a quick exchange before second and one. Poffenberger going deep. Hicks has a step, and he's got it inside the 10-yard line. Brandon Spencer beaten coverage. And the Great Danes are knocking on the door again. I tell you, I'm really impressed by Reese Poffenbarger. You know, his receiver, he was open, don't get me wrong, but that's a really, really nice deep ball. And that's something that a lot of young quarterbacks don't necessarily have right away. But that was a perfect ball to Julian Hicks, who was able to beat his man right off the line of scrimmage. Really, really good play. And now, I think they're doing the right thing here. They're starting to slow things down. They're inside the 10. You want to take some of this clock off so Fordham doesn't come back and score right away. Poffenberger is 6 of 7 throwing. First and goal from the 9 for the Great Danes. And you got one on one up top. Look in the other direction. Spencer in coverage again. It's incomplete out of bounds. And it's another good throw by Poffenberger. But this one, I, I put more on the receiver because he has to give his quarterback a little more room toward the boundary. He ran that route so close to the sideline that it was very easy for Brandon Spencer in coverage to just kind of force him towards that boundary and out of bounds where he didn't have the room to make that catch. So he's got to run that route a little bit more towards the field of play where he can get one foot down with that catch and get the touchdown. Brevin Easton was the target. He's in the slot, top of your screen, on second and goal from the nine. They put Greeny out wide now. Looking in that direction for the big tight end, and it's off his fingertips. You Albany asking for a flag with Drotty Titan coverage. The referees have let a, a decent amount go today. I think that's the right call. It was really good coverage by Drotty. But these back shoulder throws towards the goal line in this direction, sometimes just not the most effective. And they've run that twice now. And, and I would look to run something else here. You, know, you get the back shoulder. The, the defense is really looking for that, Andrew. So I think I would try to do something else here on third down. Yeah, don't tr not sure you can do it on third down. But it's surprising that Sibley has not gotten a touch on these first two tries from inside the 10. He's the running back to the QB's left. Poffenbarger smothered, overwhelmed by three Fordham defenders. Rams will use their second timeout to stop the clock with 1.20 to go before halftime. Matt Jaworski in his season debut in on a second sack. Yeah, and that was great pass rush from Fordham and kind of miscommunication on the offensive line. Ryan Greenhagen comes in free. That's the guy you circle in the game plan, so that obviously can't happen. But Greenhagen getting back on the field, Andrew. We talked about the torn ACL early on in the game. And Joe Collin was saying, look, you know, they kind of try to ease him back and get him back <laughs> into the swing of things. And that's really hard to do. I mean, Ryan Greenhagen is a bulldog. He's a warrior. He wants to be out there on every snap. Have to be smart with him, but he loves playing the game of football. He will never ask off the field. And he's starting to get back into the swing of things as he recovers from that knee injury. He is just about at the one-year mark of that injury. He was full go in terms of running by July, nine months after getting hurt. He's just one big muscle, and he's one of the best players in college football. 32 yards from Alpauco, and he puts it, puts it through to tie the game at 17 with 122 to go here before halftime. And for Fordham, this is about as well as you can do once they got to the 10. You're going to get it back for your offense. You've got one timeout. I think the whole playbook's probably open, especially when the clock stops on first down for them to move the chains. So Fordham's offense, you're fine. You've got plenty of time. You get in a field goal range or try to punch this in. But remember, you Albany gets it to start the second half. So you know, I think this first half, if they can get a stop here, if you would have told Greg Gattuso that he would go into the locker room 17-17 on the road here, Andrew, I think he would have taken it every day of the week. Especially so. after it was 10-0 yeah. relatively quickly for Fordham, and his offense had gone three and out on its first two possessions. But his defense has found its footing. The offense has 10 points on its last two touches. And now the kickoff with Fotis Kokosoulis back as usual for Fordham. John Opalco, who just knocked in the PAT, will put it on a tee.
Coco Sulis is going to let Trey Sneed return this one. And Trey Sneed's across the 30-yard line. Coco Sulis began the sprint up from the goal line, realized he wasn't going to get there in time. And Sneed does the job well enough. Good starting spot here for Ford. Now, one of the questions, too, early in the season is just from how, far, how, how long do the Rams trust their field goal unit? The 38-yarder earlier today from Brandon Peskin, that's his season long. And they still have not tried one from plus 40. So field goal range may, may still be far away from their own 35. As DeMora hit as he throws, that's incomplete. Anton Junkage, the pressure from behind, 95 in white and purple. Yeah, and uh, you were, uh, you know, you were uh, talking about the name puns before. Junkage really junked that play for <laughs> Fordham. That was a nice pass rush. But in terms of the field goal question, I think he has range to about maybe 50 yards, but I would want to get to at least the 30-yard line. Demore has time here. Trace Sneed did not make the catch. Dropped it immediately. And here's the Rams. Did not look in sync on their last possession. No. Some incomplete passes, some penalties. And now the pressure on the first play here and a drop pass from Trey Sneed on a low throw from DeMoret. And now if they don't get this first down and the play's imbalanced, does UAlbany take a timeout, potentially? A lot of very interesting scenarios based on this play here. But it's a third and long. You've got Coco Sulis in the slot. He's the go-to guy. I would look for him on this play. Looking in that direction, he's going to jump to make the catch, Coco Sulis, and he's tackled right away. And they do on the far sideline ask for their first timeout. So the UAlbany defense getting stronger and stronger as this first half progresses. And now a chance with some time and two timeouts and for their offense to do something again. Yeah, and, and Andrew, I'm a little surprised they threw it short of the sticks there to Coco Sulis. You know, you get seven yards, yes, but yeah, you know, I. I that looked like a pretty much designed play, a little five-yard out route to Coco Sulis to try to let him do the rest. And the Great Danes defense is going to protect the sticks on third and ten, and it's easier to do it in third and long. So I was just a little bit surprised that they didn't go for something a little deeper, maybe even in the middle of the field. But nonetheless, for you, Albany, great stop. They get it back here. We'll see what kind of field position they can get. If they can get decent field position, they can try to push. Will Hazlitt will punt again for Fordham. And it is Jackson Parker back at his own 20-yard line to return for U Albany. 57 seconds on the clock and the two timeouts to use. Good snap, no pressure, and a good kick. And smartly, I think because the sideline was screaming <laughs> at him, Parker lets it bounce in the end zone. He went back, wave and fair catch and it got loud across the field to leave that one alone. So instead of the two yard line, it'll be the 20 for you Albany. 48 seconds and two timeouts, a chance to really change the narrative on this entire first half. Yeah, and you've got a young quarterback, you've got a two minute drill. It's a great learning experience here for you Albany, but you're telling them be smart with the ball. I think they'll probably try some short throws here to start the drive, see what they can get and then go from there. But like you said, Andrew, two timeouts, 48 seconds, Good amount of time for them to try to get in a field goal range and take the lead before the uh, half ends. Fordham, by the way, celebrating the 20th anniversary of their first Patriot League title. Did the Great Danes have too many in the huddle? They did. Mm. And, and it, it's just those little things, right? You know, you were, you've been talking, uh, Andrew, about how they haven't had a lead this season, right? And what does that come back to? Penalties, negative plays, mental mistakes. There you get a mental mistake that leads to a penalty. Again, it's a young team. These things are going to happen, but you just have to cut those out. Two members of that 2002 Patriot League Championship team will be with us at halftime, which is still a few seconds away. That ball is dropped in the air, and there comes the flag. I wasn't sure about that one. I thought they had their feet tangled on that one, Andrew. I thought maybe that they were going to be able to get away with that one, and I think that's the point Joe Conlin is making. Now, the receiver had him beat to the inside, so that does not play in the cornerback's favor, but I mean, this could be a huge penalty here. 
Quinn Zenoble, the intended receiver, with Steven Williams in coverage. It's pass interference on him. They'll get 15 yards out to the 30, and they get first and 10. And again, you stop the clock with 42 seconds left. And still two timeouts as well for the Great Danes. Poffenberger wants his tight end again. It's incomplete, underthrown with Drotty in coverage. And Greeny's not getting up. And I'll tell you, this is a guy you already cannot afford to lose. Their leading receiver entering today. Poffenbarger loves that security blanket that Greeny provides. The, the big Great Danes tight end, 6'5", 255 pounds, sure-handed, doesn't drop a lot of balls. That is the last thing a UAlbany fan would want to see right now. He was trying to reach back through the defender for the underthrown ball. He is slowly sitting up. He's not there yet. And now he will very, very gently walk off the far sideline. And that is a big loss for this drive, at least for U Albany. Meanwhile, Fordham head coach Joe Conlon is still working the near side. Any official near that's getting a near full. And I think he's got a point on, on that pass interference play. It didn't look like a ton of contact. It looked like they got the feet tangled, but usually don't call a penalty on that, but they did. So this is second and 10. Still at their own 30 are the Great Danes in a tie game late in this second quarter. Greenhagen blitzes for Fordham. Poffenbarger to the top of your screen, falling down on the catch, and another Albany timeout. Tyler Merwarth made that catch for the Great Danes. Yeah, New Albany's been taking a lot of deep shots, Andrew, here. And that time they kind of check it down short. And I think that's a good play. Throw was a little off from Poppenbarger, made his receiver go down. But you're going to have third and about five or six here for New Albany. And Ford in the last couple of plays, I've noticed well, one safety high. So we were talking about that on the other side. Does New Albany try to take a shot? They've been trying a lot of these back shoulder throws, uh, which are not always easy to execute. So I would try to see if they can get something short, get the first down, then get up quickly and maybe spike it or run a quick play. Rams will have three down linemen for this third and six. Four wide receivers for U Albany. Poffenbarger over the middle, a catch near the sticks, fighting for it back on the field is Greeny, and that's a first down. So he misses one play with the injury, comes right back out there and resets the drive. Now you gotta get on it. Clock's running again with the chain set. Fading near side into traffic and again a flag comes out. Nasir McNair's the coverage. Jackson Parker, the intended receiver. And that's half the design of that play. Yeah. Catch, great, if not, a defender not turning his head, forcing you out of bounds, and it just keeps moving the Great Danes up the field with just 11 seconds to work with now. And you have one timeout, so you can use the whole middle of the field. I think you have to get down to about the 30. The wind is blowing in from this direction on a possible field goal, so I think that means you have to get maybe a few more yards to feel good about John Apalco potentially hitting a field goal in this direction. Not heavy winds, but whatever is blowing is left to right across your screen into the face right now of this Albany offense. Poffenberger feels the heat, gets away from it. He's got to be quick here. Back over the middle, he's got Sibley. He's got room to the outside, thinking about six, and he's going to get it. On the final play of the half, he weaves his way through a defense. And Albany leads for the first time today and the first time this season. Wow, Andrew. I was motioning for Sibley when he got to about the 25-yard line with the time situation. I was saying, get down, get down. And no, he saw the room and he weaved through it. And what a play to end the half for you, Albany. Credit to Sibley for seeing that because I thought for sure he was going to get down with about three seconds left. 
but he gets straight through, and that'll end the half with U Albany in front. Unbelievable. The extra point completes it, 24-17. The Great Danes lead at the break. It was 10-0 Fordham, but U Albany found its rhythm on offense and defense. Two big plays, a run from Sibley, and then a catch and run from Sibley, beating the buzzer. It's 24-7 U Albany here in the Bronx. Coming up at halftime. Highlights and stats, a breakdown of those first 30 minutes, and a chat with two members of Fordham's 2002 Patriot League team. All of that coming up here in just a second, but first it was Poffenbarger, then it was Sibley, and then it's in the end zone for the touchdown. Yeah, nice to meet you. Jimmy, nice to meet you. Andrew. Nice to meet you. Thank you, sir. Yep, yep, you good, brother. Chris Rose, right? Like the flower? Rose. 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 My bad. Rose. I apologize. Rose. Can you guys disinfect these things or what? No. Yeah, you're good. <laughs> <laughs> good. I'm good. Is I can hear you. Okay? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Welcome back to Jack Coffee Field. It's Fordham with a 24-17 hole against U Albany here at the break. Now, that's today. Way back in 2002, this Fordham program won its first ever Patriot League title. And two members of that team are with us here right now. Tag Court again, Chris Rhodes. Guys, thanks for being with us. And my first remark, I have a question. I graduated 
the May before you guys won. Why couldn't you get this done the year before? I've been here to enjoy it. We, we turned it around that year, though. We, that was, yeah, that was the year we turned it around. Yeah. That was my, that was my uh, freshman, freshman year. year. Yeah. I, like to take all the, I like to take all the credit like it was, it was my <laughs> final piece. Yeah. <laughs> well, so I, mean, I was here for Dave Clawson's first year right. when this program went 0-11. I was here and for then, that. I, I played in every game. So what, what changed? Had, take, walk me through four, three, four years of progression to a, to a title. I was actually uh, on 9-11. I, I, I called and I, I talked with... Uh, Dave Clawson, uh, some of the other coaches, and we always talk about it. We talk about the old 11 year, we talk about the championship year, and we talk about just kind of the, the commitment that we decided. It wasn't, you know, it, it was organic. It was a lot, a lot of kids, a lot of kids, I mean, we yeah. were uh, just kind of made a commitment. We're like, you know, we're here. It was a good year. I felt bad for the seniors that year. We had a lot of good seniors that year. Jerry McDermott yeah. was a senior that year. Um, Jim Wells. Uh, he, he was a senior that year, and um, we just made a commitment. It was a tough year for them, um, but we stuck through it. We started hitting the weight room, uh, started eating. The coaches made sure we were in the weight room and that we ate, and we did training. We, we came. We, we didn't. We didn't go to any summers, and we just kind of organically stuck together. Yeah, I think the re I think rebuilding year is always tough, right? So that was the rebuilding year. <laughs> take a break and then come back and keep talking to Tad and Chris right after this at Jack Coffee Field. Welcome back to Jack Coffee Field, talking with a couple of our friends from the 2002 team. 20 years since that legendary Fordham team. Can you guys believe it that it's been that long? Does it feel like yesterday? Does it feel like that long ago? <laughs> no, no, absolutely not. <laughs> we just were talk down there talking about it. I'm like, guys, there are kids here at this school that are attending this school that weren't even born when we were here. What we're talking about 2002. It's crazy. So time flew, definitely flew, man. I, I, I would never think it was 20 years already. Chris, do you remember a, a moment, a game where – it became real for you guys. You went, you went, we're good and we can get this done. Yeah, I uh, definitely remember it. It was right here. <laughs> we, uh, it was my junior year. Tad was a freshman. Uh, he was playing until you were at Nickelback. Sure. And uh, we, we beat Colgate in our game number two. And that's when we were like, all right, we're going to be good. Now, we, went, we, uh, we went like seven and four that year, um, or eight and three. Was that, the, was that the game you caught him and uh, he performed the ball? Yeah. yeah. See, yeah, so, so, so he's been humble, right? I'm, I'm going to tell you guys. His, his play was the reason why we started bringing live. All right, guys. Yeah. Thanks Sorry. so much for joining us. Sorry. we got to run quick. Second half is on the way. Fordham and you all, but you're next. Thank you. Yeah, so, so it, I'll tell the story. You were right. humble. So <laughs> literally, there was a long bomb on a play, man, and, and this guy was gone. I mean, Chris had to be about 30 yards away from him. And he hawked him. He ran him down right before he crossed the goal line. He punched the ball out of his hand. He didn't score a touchdown. It was our ball touchdown. Yep. After that, our whole sideline went crazy. The 
fans went crazy. And I'm, that's when the whole game turned around and the whole season turned around. I, I scored a zero on that play because I was, I was supposed to be free that play. <laughs> local, local <laughs> definitely got in trouble, though. Definitely. <laughs> Coach, Coach Trick has something to say about it. So you couldn't – you can't – negate the, the first oh, I, mean, I, think, I mean you know momentum is a good thing always in the football game I hope I hope the Rams turn it around in the second half but uh that was a moment I was like oh man I am about I'm never gonna play again <laughs> I was like I gotta go right the catch me I was always fast we were always fast we were always fast <laughs> uh, before we let you guys go yeah. uh, how much have you seen of this year's team and kind of what are your thoughts on, on how they played early in the season so I caught the first game um I, I, I mean I've seen a lot i seen a lot of potential in them um, this is the uh, second game I actually got to see. It's just, this is the little things, right? The little things you got to tweak here and there. You got to gel, right? So it's, it's still the beginning of the season. It takes time for a defense to gel. Once they gel, like they'll, they'll, they'll be in good shape this year. I, I agree. I, I, I live in New Orleans. I, I was from New Orleans. I went to high school in LA, though. And uh, so it's hard for me to catch the games. And I, even on Saturdays, I have, I have young kids now. So yeah. it, those of you who have young kids know that <laughs> your weekends are not yours any longer. Yeah. But I always check the scores. I always check the scorecard. They're able to get it together. You know. It, Ted's absolutely right. One of the best things about our squad, I think the 2002 squad, was my senior year. But uh, we had good young kids that came in and like bought in to our stuff, and we weren't really selfish about owning everything. We just wanted to win. Because when you go on 11, you're like, man, <laughs> I just want to win. I just want to win. That's what it went. What does it mean for the program as a whole, Chase Edmonds in the NFL, other guys sure. getting drafted? How good is it to just have Fordham in the NFL? So it is good. It's a good feeling. It, it, it speaks a lot to uh, – truly, uh, I'll give uh, – I'll give Jason George, our strength and conditioning coach. I had a deal with him and, uh, when, <laughs> when I was getting my NFL looks. But um, it is a good feeling. It's always good to see Fordham represented. It, you know, I'm from the South, and so everybody talks about SEC football. And I'm like, look, man. They're like, who do you root for the SEC? I was like, I root for the Fordham Rams every Saturday. That's the only school I care about. Um, it, it's a good feeling to see that we're represented at all levels of football and that we continue to be. I hope the school continues to invest in the program. And before we go, man, we have to make sure we give a shout-out to two of our teammates who are no longer with us, Absolutely. Uh, Anthony Amangio and Aki Jones, who yep. had a great football career in the NFL as well. But uh, he was in Tad's class, and he was yeah. a good, good, good man, both very good men. For sure. I, I know they're on people's minds today. Guys, it is great to see you and the rest of the team here. And, again, I can't believe it's been 20 years. But 20 years. 20 years later, 20 congrats years. on a, on a great time it, man. program. It's Thank good you, to be back you. in the Bronx. That's good Chris good. Rhodes, Tad Cordegay, Andrew Bogus, Jimmy Sullivan with you. The second half of Fordham and New Albany when we come back to the Bronx.
17 hole to climb out of here when this third quarter begins. But before we get to the game down below us, Jimmy, I just want to go back to Ted Cornegay and Chris Rhodes, everybody else on that Fordham 02 team. Guys that are here in the building today, guys that will hopefully be around throughout the year because Fordham is doing kind of a week to week, like down memory lane trip about what game happened on this week back two decades ago. And you know, Dave Claw was here as a student on the radio station, so was kind of around these guys as Dave Clawson came in and went from 0-11 and then it was I think four wins and then six wins and then the 2020 the 2002 title and it really was about building a program which sounds cliche but that's what Chris and Tab were talking about is that things began in 1999-2000 then slowly just walked forward and became a team that they both had rings on just now. Yeah and a culture like that obviously it doesn't it doesn't happen overnight, right? You know, you have to kind of build it over the course of a few years, and that takes time, but uh, I think it speaks so much to Dave Clawson, right? We were talking with him off the air uh, after the interview, and we were talking about you know, Dave Clawson, and you know, he's, he's not necessarily a rah-rah guy, right? But the guys respect him, right? You know, he's not gonna pound tables, he's not gonna throw things, but he's, you know, he expects greatness, and he has throughout his career, and that's what he's doing now at Wake Forest, and they've got a really good team, and, you know, it, it, it's building a culture, right? You know, we've seen that, you know, even in Fordham the last few years, right? When Joe Conlin took over, this was, you know, frankly, not a good team. And they've become a good team over the last few years through recruiting and through culture building. And that's what it takes nowadays in college football, and that's what uh, Fordham's been able to do. What goes on in Joe Conlin's halftime locker room when it was 10 nothing? now it's 24-17, the third quarter's on the way.
Here we are again from attack, atop Jack Coffee Field. Andrew Bogish and Jimmy Sullivan with you. Just about set for half number two between Fordham and U Albany. The Rams race to a 10 0 lead, but the Great Danes up seven here as this third quarter begins. Their first lead of the season arriving today off losses at number 10 Baylor and then a home loss to New Hampshire. That was a CAA game last weekend. And they did not start the way they wanted to start this one, but they certainly rebounded over the last quarter plus to have this lead. And they get the football to begin the third quarter. Roy Alexander from his own three. Across the 20 yard line goes Alexander and back out comes the Great Dane offense, which had a Todd Sibley 75 yard touchdown run and then on a, what ended up being the final play of the half, a little dump down to Sibley, who came across the field through defenders, turned a corner and found himself in the end zone. That play began with, I thought the quarterback was taking too much time to get rid of the ball, was gonna negate a chance for a field goal. And then with Sibley running, Jimmy's waving him to get down to try and <laughs> kick that field goal. And he ignored all of us and went to the end zone. And they are right back on the attack. And that ball is batted back to Poffenbarger. And then he fumbled it. It's still loose. Fordham thinks they have it. And they do. Well, that's one way to start the half. A batted ball caught by the quarterback. And then he fumbles. Yeah, and, that, and that's kind of part of being a young quarterback, right? I mean, you know, you have... You know, Poffenbarger, he's thinking, okay, I'm gonna make a play here, right? Is that necessarily the best thing to do in that situation, or is it better to just kind of bat that ball down? And that's a mistake by Poffenbarger, to try to take that on the run. You just have to kind of take your losses there. The pass got batted down, just let it go. And I know he's trying to make a play, but great play by this Fordham defense to strip that ball. And now they have it in great field position. It is his first turnover in two and a half games, and it comes on one of the oddest plays you're going to see. And Fordham gets an immediate chance on offense, and they run points, and MJ White's got him. Third touchdown pass for Tim DeMorad, and this one gets his team almost even early third quarter. Great design by Fordham. They used that screen look that we saw so many times in the first half. Defense sucked in, MJ right on the wheel route. Wide open, easy throw for Tim DeMora. And now an extra point away from tying the game. Perfect, perfect response by Fordham out of the half. Last two DeMora touchdown passes have been to wide receivers running freely. Cody, and now Wright, and now Brandon Peskin for the point after. Peskin drills that one, and just like that, we're even. In 22 seconds, Solvany fumbles. Next play, Fordham's in the end zone. And we are right back where we started, about one o'clock, even on the scoreboard. And now we see how the Great Danes react to their second bit of adversity here this afternoon. First, the bad start, and now the turnover and the quick Fordham touchdown. And we were talking with the guys at the half about how they went from 0-11 to winning a conference title in the span of four years. And, and a lot of that is learning how to win, right? And I think this Fordham team has really learned how to win, right? Okay, you go down at the half, all right, create a turnover, give your offense a short field, get a touchdown. U Albany's trying to go along kind of that same track. So it's a really fascinating game right now. You got a, a lot of young players on the field for U Albany and a ton of experience on the field for Fordham. And these are tend to be situations where experience wins out, Andrew. And I think we saw that here early in the second half. But now, Great Danes have a chance to respond and kind of shift the momentum again. A lot of folks on homecoming here in the Bronx left the stands, went to the homecoming tent, went back to the tailgate, and then missed a lot in the first 22 seconds of the third quarter. Another short kickoff, Jackson Parker to return, shy of the 25 yard line. So right back out come the Great Danes. After Poffenbarger, the quarterback, caught his own pass on a reflection and then fumbled, trying to gain yards. And, and Poffenbarger has to have amnesia here, right? He's got to respond. He played a really good first half, I thought, in a lot of ways. He made a bad mistake there, but 
that's over. That's done. You've got the ball. You've got a chance to go downfield, get the lead right back. That has to be the focus. For young players, that's easier said than done. They still have not officially given the fumble recovery to anybody on the Fordham side. And it didn't seem like anybody actually got up with the football from the scrum. So not sure who got it. Todd Sibley gets one yard running on first down. It's ironic, too. We were talking with Greg Gattuso, the U Albany head coach, and he was saying, well, we haven't created enough turnovers. We haven't fallen on loose balls. We've had opportunities. Well, there's an opportunity right there. Fordham falls on it. They take full advantage. That's kind of what winning teams do. U Albany's trying to get there. Fordham is there right now. Poffenbarger throwing on second and nine. He's got time, and he's got Crimson Noble at the 40-yard line with a great Dane first down. That's a really good throw by Poffenbarger. Zenoble ran a little corner route to the sideline, had his man beat, and that is a first down to the 40. And now you get back in rhythm again, and that mistake kind of drifts to the rear view. I don't think we've mentioned yet that Jonathan Coste, an all-Patriot League defensive lineman, is not playing for Fordham today. He's on the sideline with a foot in a boot. He got hurt last weekend in the win at Monmouth. And he's had some issues staying healthy. Draw, room, Sibley. A wrecking ball straight ahead to the 48-yard line. And it's funny, just as you mentioned Jonathan Coste, Andrew, Todd Sibley finds a hole right where Coste would usually be, right, that nose tackle position. So that's a, a loss for Fordham. And credit to you, Albany. They have exploited that all day. They've had room to run. And uh, the, their offensive line, I think, has done a really, really good job. Three wide receivers, Greeny at tight end, and Jose Lopez in the backfield. Here's his first carry, trying to get to the outside, and he's not going to get there. Greenhagen slowed him down. Williams finished him off. That Lopez substitution is interesting because he's more of a, a passing down back. He's the guy who kind of comes in on third downs, so either picks up a block or, or he's kind of a check down option for Poffenbarger. Now you got third and short. And we'll see kind of what they come up with. I wouldn't be surprised to see them go with the run once more. And we'll see if they get Poffenbarger on the move too. It looks like they're going to split him out wide. This is Joey Carino, their number two quarterback, running for the first down. So we saw Sibley, the running back, take a direct snap in the first half. This time, Poffenbarger goes wide as the second quarterback in the formation. And Carino moves the chains. Yeah, that's a, a really good call. I like that, uh, that play call a lot there by Jared Ambrose. Bring in the backup quarterback. He's, you know, he's kind of your, your big running quarterback, right? He can go in there, get a couple of yards, and get just enough. Jared Ambrose was the Delaware offensive coordinator the last couple of years. Saw them last season. They had some QB issues. And they had a package with a quarterback who is a lot like Florida Tim Tebow on a mm. CAA level in terms of wasn't going to beat you with his arm, was going to run the ball, Anthony Paoletti, and they had a lot of creative plays with him. Short gain on first down, second and nine. Ford making some late substitutions here on defense. Poffenbarger wants to go deep, looking down the right seam, and that's a catch. Beautiful throw, hauled in by Roy Alexander. Wow, that is a great throw by Poffenbarger. Alexander had a skosh of separation, Andrew, really not much there, and he just dropped it in the bucket. He has a really nice deep ball for a receiver to catch. The nose comes down, that's how you want to catch it as a receiver. I tell you, I'm really liking this Reese Poffenbarger. His first collegiate season was a backup at ODU last year. Transferring after spring ball, simply breaks a tackle, reaching end zone, touchdown! Todd Sibley's third score today, and right back in front go the Great Danes. Heck of a drive by you, Albany, and this is a great play design by Jared Ambrose. Brings the receiver in motion, so that sucks everybody over to the left and then they give it to Sibley on the right. I think they might review this just to see if he's in. But they give it to Sibley on the right, and he's able to do the rest. Great, great play design, and really great offense today by U Albany. They've been really impressive 
so far today. I've liked a lot of the stuff that they've run. They had some really nice designs, and then there it pays off with what is for now a touchdown. Rich Garger is the replay official. First time he's had a call sent to him. Now we are having some technical difficulties in our booth, so we don't have replay feeds in front of us right now. So please forgive Jimmy and I for not being able to talk through whether or not Todd Sibley made that far pylon. But whether he did or not, Sibley last week in the loss to New Hampshire ran for 105 at a touchdown. And his head coach told us during the week, Sibley's emergence in that game actually might have been his favorite part of the effort on offense. As good as Poffenbarger was, they, they need Sibley to run the football effectively. Plus, it's a guy that spent multiple years at Pitt. High-end high school recruit, went to Pitt, just kind of fell out of the rotation because he didn't fit what they were doing in a new offensive coordinator. So he needed a new home, and they were happy to take him, and he is clearly a weapon. Yeah, he certainly is. I mean, he's so hard to get down. That's just what I keep going back to. You know, when you try to tackle him, we always say in football, low man wins, right? And he's so good at getting his pads down, running people over. He has a burst of speed where he can get around you. I've been really impressed with Todd Sibley and also the offensive line. They really create a lot of room for him. They do a really good job pulling the guards outside, creating space for him. And Todd Sibley's fast when you get him in a straight line. And they've been able to do that really effectively here uh, so far today. Bill McKeever says the ruling stands. It's a touchdown. Albany was already assuming that, had their PAT unit out there waiting before the announcement. And here's Opalco to complete the touchdown. And the Great Danes are back in front, 31-24. A really solid answer to the quarterback fumbling and Fordham turning that into a touchdown to open the quarter. They march right back down the field and back into the lead. A very eventful first 419 of this third quarter. We've had a turnover and two touchdowns. It was 24-17, you already at the break. It's now 31-24, Great Danes. And the Fordham offense about to go back on the field, but the lead story maybe continues to be the Fordham defense here, Jimmy, because historically good offense over the first two weeks for Fordham 
covered up some issues, especially last week against Monmouth. There were some points off turnovers, short fields, that led to some of those Wagner points, and the defense did a really good job closing out that game. But last week in particular, when Fordham won, despite giving up 713 yards of offense, almost 400 out on the ground, as Fotis Coco Sulis takes the return out of bounds, there's a flag in the middle of the field. But this defense right now, all of a sudden can't slow down the Great Dane offense, just like last week they couldn't slow down Monmouth. Yeah, and, and again, it goes back to a lot of what Joe Conlon told us during the week, right? Gap discipline, finishing plays, finishing tackles. You know, defense, yes, it's about, you know, technique and, and play calling and all that, but it's also about, you know, execution, attitude, being able to finish those tackles. And right now, Fordham's defense just is not gelling on that level. I think they'll get better as the season goes along, but they're missing tackles, they're missing gaps, and it's it looks a little bit like Monmouth right now, and that is not what Fordham wants at all. They're also taking some penalties on defense and here on special teams, a hold during the return. So they begin at their own 21 yard line, off a of play fake, Demorat floating down the seam, Coco Sulis out of his reach. The throw is off Demorat's back foot, under some duress, Coco Sulis was open, but just couldn't get there. Yeah, good idea by Tim DeMora. Coco Sulis had leverage to the inside, so he could have easily hit that throw. Uh, just a little bit too inside, and we've seen that a few times today as uh, we have a stoppage here. But you know, DeMora has just missed a few throws here and there, not by a lot, but a situation like that where he had Coco Sulis a bit open, just not quite able to hit him. Four wide receivers in this set. One of the Great Danes almost jumped. That's Jaleel Johnson, a backup linebacker. Draw for Trey Sneed, another flag. Both the referee and the umpire threw it. I'm gonna go ahead, Andrew, and say this was a hold based on where it was thrown. There was a lot of grabbing going on and that certainly looked like a trademark. So they accepted on Gio Patente, the center. Two holds, the center and the right tackle. Only one can count. But again, we were talking about this before. Now you're all the way behind the chains. And they actually declined both because they got the stop on Trey Sneed, but again, third and long here, right? Third and 11, as good as Tim DeMorad is, this is just not a high percentage proposition for any offense. This is an interesting decision here by Greg Gattuso. Instead of second and 10, he signs up for third, I'm sorry, second and 20, he signs up for third and 10. Closer to forcing a punt, but that marker in more reach for a good offense. DeMora to the outside, Coco Stubas to catch, and there's the first down. Yeah, and I was okay with what Greg Gattuso did because you want to have less plays against this Fordham offense. The problem is not a lot of people have much of an answer for Fotis Coco Sulis the way he's playing right now. Gets wide open on that play, easy first. Rolling to Morat, looking down the field, going deep for the Keys corner on the run, got him! Falling down inside the 25! A better throw, and maybe Carter keeps running into the end zone, but a little underthrown. He tracks it down and moves the chains in a big way. Beautiful play by Fordham. It's a back post route by Carter. He was trying to hit Coco Sulis over the middle. Saw Carter open. That was his second read. He went deep, and he hit him. Inside the UAlbany 25. Demorat's got time. He slings one, felt it a catch and a spin. And he fights his way near the 10-yard line. Makai Felton week to week doing more damage on offense. And Andrew, I really like how patient Tim Demorad is being, right? There's no rush. He's taking his time. He's going through his progressions. There he finds Felton for a nice game. Felton caught two touchdown passes at Monmouth. Now watch out for some kind of screen here with this formation. It is first and 10 from the 11. Demorad steps up. And it's intercepted, Isaac Duffy near the end zone. But there's a flag, Coco Sulis ended up on the turf. That's who Duffy was covering. 
when Coco Sulis went down, Duffy was alone to make the interception. It's not gonna count. Now what I don't understand about this, and I think it's the right call, but why does he wait so long to throw that flag? Because that, that's pass interference no matter what the outcome of that play is, right? So it's supposed to be you see it, you throw the flag, boom. Now I think they got it right in the end, but you know, very late flag there, Andrew. Sometimes they just whiff on the grab. Yeah, though. well, Maybe that's he missed very the first time coming out of the belt. I don't know, but I'm with you. Like he, it was almost like he was an NBA basketball ref waiting to call an and one. <laughs> but see, that's why Bill Belichick puts the challenge flag in his sock so he can grab it that easily. It's first and goal at the three. Little inside screen, and that ball is almost caught off a deflection. There are bodies everywhere. It was intended for MJ Wright. There are defenders all around him. The ball flipped in the air, and more than one defender tried to catch it. Nobody did, and finally incomplete. Second and goal. And now you've got a heavier set here for Fordham. Two tight ends. Looks like a run set, but then again, you got those two receivers up top. And that's Coco Sulis, not an actual running back who leaves the backfield. And now you got a linebacker on him. He's open, DeMora missed him. He was the hot route. That linebacker came in, the pressure. Ben Howe Jones forced a quicker release, and it pays off. Yeah, and Fordham had that exactly where they wanted it, Andrew. That was a great catch on your part. They motioned Coco Sulis out. Without the pressure, that's an easy touchdown. But again, pressure makes quarterbacks do things they don't want to do. And Tim DeMora missed that throw because of the pressure. So now third and goal. Sneed in at running back. Another pass, more pressure. Demorat just flips it away. And I think that's gonna be grounding because that didn't get to the line. They're gonna talk about this. There was nobody over there either. That should be grounding and by there's the flag. yeah. And that's important because that pushes Brandon Peskin back. The conversation continues here. Okay. Bill McKeever yeah. says there was a receiver close enough. So the line judge Kevin Taylor came in, talked him into the flag, and a second official came in, shared what he saw, and the flag gets picked up. And that's important, but this is a tricky kick. For Brandon Peskin, you're on the right hash. He's got to pull it, and now they're going to blow the whistle again. Somebody, one of the officials coming over from the Albany sideline now. This is just a 22-yard try for Peskin, who was good from 38 back in the first quarter. But still, for this U Albany defense, I mean, great stop. and more stops than not as of late for them as a whole. Yeah, and the, the touchdown they gave up at the beginning of this half, that was with a short field, so you can't really blame them too much for that. Although missed coverage. Absolutely. Peskin drills it through, Rams get three to make this a four point game. And we are not even midway through this third quarter. Points galore here since halftime. It's U Albany by four.
Welcome back to Jack Coffee Field. Andrew Bogish and Jimmy Sullivan with you. Fordham has scored 10 points since halftime, seven for U Albany. Rams making a habit of being in games that don't necessarily feature a lot of defense. A 52-49 win for them last week at Monmouth. Roy Alexander off his own goal line makes a couple of Rams miss. And then a second and third effort gets him near the 25 yard line as a flag comes flying in from the far side. We'll see if, oh, we'll see what this is, if it's a hold or was there something on the tackle? It's a hold on Jack Matola of U Albany, so that'll back the Great Danes up a little bit. I'll say this for Fordham's defense, Andrew. You know, as maligned as they've been over the last few weeks, when they've needed a play, when they've needed a stop, especially late in games, they've tended to get it. This is kind of a situation here where they need a stop. So we'll see if they can get it here. Only the third accepted penalty against U Albany. Fordham has got seven of them for 69 yards. Great Danes running on first down, simply puts his head down and James Conway takes him down. There's a helmet off. And there's an injured Great Dane as well. And it's Sibley. Sibley smacking at his calves. You know, you worry in a situation like this, especially early in the season, about cramping and endurance and things of that nature. Uh, yeah. I'm not saying this is what that is because you know we're not going to speculate on injuries obviously, but it would seem very possible. We'll take the time out with them here in the Bronx. Todd Sibley slowly walked off the field for U Albany. Second and 10, quick throw, Poffenbarger, and it's incomplete. Good coverage, Stephen Williams, a little too high for Brevin Easton. So here's a third and 10, and Jimmy, you said it, not a mandatory stop for Fordham, but could be an important step if they got it to keep some momentum, and here they are at third and 10. Especially Andrew with this field position too. If you can get a stop here, you're gonna get the ball back, possibly on the plus side of midfield. That's a huge plus. 
Offenbarger gets it away just in time. A catch, Easton reaching, he's close to the marker. And it's good enough, it appears, for a U Albany first down. And there's the official signal to Chain Gang. Yeah, and that's a big first down, if nothing else, because of the field position we were just talking about. Good play by Easton, he comes back for the ball, shields off the defender, and then it's just about effort, right? You know, he turns the legs and he's able to get that first down. Laverie well, Banted, the third running back we've seen for U Albany. And he's going to get a carry. And he's across the 25 yard line. James Conway on top of him for Fordham. And for you, Albany, Andrew, in that first half, we saw a lot of deep shots, a lot of back shoulder throws. Haven't really seen that much here in this second half. We did see one nice throw down near the goal line, but I wonder if they're not thinking both Fordham's defense and you, Albany's offense, about that. Well, when they're playing with the lead, they can be a little more deliberate to at the very least not give the ball back to Fordham. Intended for Green, for Green the tight end, Natani Drotti in coverage, there was some contact, Green looked for a flag and there wasn't one. And I think Greeny might have had a point because, look, he's got a size advantage on Natani Drotti, okay? I think it's safe to say that. And contact against Greeny does not have the same effect as contact on a lot of other football players. So I think Drotti did get away with a little contact here, but look, one safety high, so let's see if they try to take another deep shot again. They converted third and 10 a moment ago. This is third and eight for you, Albany. Still in their own end. Offenbarger going down the field, and he just leaves it short. Greg Gattuso is running the sideline, wondering where the flag for that is but there's gonna be no call. There's been a lot of contact from both sets of defensive backs on sideline routes this afternoon. It felt like that had been called in the first half and it wasn't called here. Yeah, they've let a lot go, Andrew, and they've let, they're have they letting the boys play, as they say. And that one I actually think they, they had pretty much right because the receiver ran out of bounds. Whistles and a flag at the snap for the punt. And they're gonna back the Great Danes up a few more yards here. The false start came from one of the outside guys, Isaac Duffy. But again, this is helping the Fordham field position because now Thornton can set up shop on his own 35 yard line. Tyler Pastula, Delaware transfer, first team all CAA last year. Transferring to Albany, gets this one away. It's high, it's short. And that hit a Fordham player, but Thornton able to drop on it. Damaris Rice Williams was backing up. Locked up with a great day and couldn't get away from there. It dropped basically right between them. That was a live ball and Thornton lucky to get on it for Fordham. Very lucky bounce, Andrew. It hit a Fordham player on that. I think it hit a Holy Cross player, and then it fell right to Cole Thornton. Alert play from him, but yes, a big break for the Rams. You did what I've been afraid of all day. Usually when we're here, and there's white and purple, it is Holy Cross. But it's did I all Holy today. Cross? You did. It oh. We should have had a jar. I would have pegged myself to have done it first. Trey Sneed wrestled down. I promised myself all day I wasn't going to do that. We've also been fighting. When I was growing up in New York, it was SUNY Albany. But now it's the University of Albany or it's U Albany. That is the preferred way to reference the school. Not even just plain old Albany. Demorat, a heave, looking for Carter. The adjustment of the catch. Asking for applause as he gets up with the football. There is a flag way back down the field and this one's coming back. Oh man, it's the right call too. Somebody got tackled on the U Albany defensive line. Oh, that's a killer. That is a killer. Crowds booing because it negates a huge momentum play from Carter and there have been more flags on Fordham than U Albany today, but most of them have been deserved. I think that one was deserved too. Joe Conlon's not happy about it, so he's 
he's going to defend his guys. But again, I think that's the right call. So instead of being near the red zone, they've got a second and 20 back at their own 30. And you need eight yards here to give yourself a chance, basically. Pressure straight up the middle. DeMora gets away from it, gets a throw off, and it's incomplete. Wanted MJ White, tight, tight coverage on the outside by Christian Lewis to break it up. And Andrew, we were talking about Tim DeMorat and his hand in the first half, and how he was having issues. Not so much the hand now, but he is taking some hits right now. And, you know, that body blows kind of add up over time. And they are really getting home on Tim DeMorat right now. This offensive line really starting to struggle. Offensive line for Ford returning four starters from a year ago. The one missing is Nick Zakel in the NFL. Carter makes that catch at the turf at the original line of scrimmage. So this is fourth and 10, shy in midfield. There's another punt. And Andrew, another example of how a penalty kills your momentum, right? Instead of having the ball inside the U Albany 30, you have uh, a punt. And you know, it's a big momentum shift. And U Albany gets off the field yet again. And it goes in the books as just a 10 yard hole, but it was a 45 yard penalty because Fordham was around the 25 of U Albany and came back to their own 30. Another good punt from Hazlitt. A big high bounce, but nobody can get there. It's in the end zone for a touchback. That one really got up in the jet stream, huh? Hazlitt doing a good job, but a rarity. Six punts through two games. He's at three already here with a quarter plus to go. And back out comes the Fordham defense. And you know, Andrew, what I'd like to see a little bit more of on this U Albany drive and going forward in this game, I want to see if they can get Poppenbarger on the run. So good throwing on the run, using his legs. Want to see if they can do that and affect this Fordham defense a little more. Still no Todd Sibley left on their last drive. We thought it was cramping, but still no return. So it's Lopez with nowhere to go. Mike Courtney up from the safety spot in on the stop. And that's a huge loss for Fordham, Andrew. You know, if New Albany can't get Sibley back into this game, you really lose that dimension of your running game, the power, the force that they've been so successful with today. And scanning the far sideline, I don't even see Sibley with a helmet on in the group of offensive subs near the 20 yard line. Poffenbarger's got time, little sidearm flip out of the backfield, that's Lopez and he lowers the shoulder to get the first down. And again, Andrew, that's just taking what the defense gives you, right? And you're a young quarterback, that's what you gotta do. And they try to deep post, that wasn't open. Try to go route, that wasn't open. So he takes the check down and they're able to move the sticks and get a nice game. Now a carry for Lopez and they'll get a yard or two out of that. And Lopez lost his helmet. That's why the whistles blow. The clock stops, and he's got to go off for a play. Clock will restart, and a bump up on the play clock as well for the Great Danes. And Andrew, this is where as an offensive play caller, you don't have your top two running backs. At least for this play, you don't have your top running back. You have to get a little creative to run the ball. Poffenberger will throw. There's a flag as Greeny makes the catch, escorted out of bounds by Drotty. That has been the matchup all afternoon. Yeah, and that came out the second that snap was off. And I would guess, based on that timing, that it would be an illegal formation. Or an offside. Second and nine becomes second and four for U Albany. Another Ram penalty. And Andrew, that would have been probably, what, third and three, third and four, if that play went off? Now you get an extra free down, basically, if you're UAlbany. Second and four officially. The run to the outside's a good one. It's another UAlbany first down. That's Banton, LaValle Banton getting some carries here. 
with Sibley off the field. And at the moment, it doesn't really matter who's running it for you, Albany. Because they're giving the room to run. You know, the, the guards have done a really good job getting outside, the tackles have created edges, and the running backs have taken advantage. Getting late third quarter, Albany's got the ball, got a four point lead, and another flag on its way out. Yeah. One on one coverage. Anthony, Tony, Itoya in coverage, looking for Roy Alexander. There's also a flag in the backfield. Yeah, we'll see what we're looking at here. Uh, I will say on Tony Itoya's part. So. A break for Fordham, holding on you, Albany negates the pass interference on Tony Itoya. And I will say for Tony Itoya's part, I don't believe in good penalties, but if he doesn't do that, that's a touchdown. So you'll take those if you get beaten coverage. Obviously not ideal. Still first and 10. You, Albany, resets before the snap. Hoffenberger pulled that back, and that's a good break up, Nasir McNair. Little slant, looking for Julian Hicks. But McNair was there, and for a change, no flag. And really good play by McNair because he's playing outside leverage on Hicks. So Hicks should have that inside slant, theoretically, but McNair is able to get in there, make the play, and get the breakup. Second and 10 for you, Albany. Poffenberger to the outside and no one's home. A little confusion. Alexander and Easton were in that area, but Easton went down the field. Alexander went inside. The throw went outside. Third down. Yeah, and you already there, Andrew. They ran a pick play, but the problem is they picked their own receivers. So <laughs> that's not really what you want to do. Uh, they just ran into each other, and I think somebody had to have run the wrong route on that play. Making some noise in the Bronx, swung a defensive stand, and we got all sorts of movement. Yeah, they're going to get a defensive offsides instead. So it's third and five. Alfonso Dixon call for the offside. I think Joe Conlon's upset because Dixon was on one end of the defensive line and the other tackle jump for you, Albany. That's just a matter of what happened first. Because somebody was forced offside, but it was close. So now third and five, Poffenberger takes a shot, and Alexander makes a catch. Threw it up for grabs. Alexander grabs it, it's a U Albany first down. And Andrew, we talk a lot about Poffenbarger tonight, but these receivers have been incredible too. Poffenbarger really kind of undercooked this throw, and Alexander was able to come back to the ball over a defender. That is an incredibly difficult catch. And Alexander made it, really nice play. Alexander, the wide out, starts this play in the backfield of Poffenbarger. Poffenbarger's got all day into the end zone. Caught, but two steps out of bounds by the tight end Greeny. Yeah, that one may as well have been a throwaway, Andrew, with where that ball was placed by Poffenbarger. And uh, he put it in a spot where only his guy could get it. So not, not a bad decision at all. Really good coverage there by Fordham. They had everybody locked up. And uh, they were able to get a stop on first down. But again, they just can't seem to get off the field. You all has converted two third downs to keep this drive going. Under two to go third quarter. And you've got a one-on-one -on -one here at the bottom. Hicks the receiver. Poffenberger looks that way, puts it in the air that way, hits. That's a touchdown. Another beautiful throw and catch. Okay. 
Hicks got up and had a word or two for Nasir McNair. The officials broke that up and you already is back to celebrating another touchdown. You know, you can scheme all you want and you can design the best plays in the world, but a lot of the time it's just, just a matter of going beyond the X's and O's. And Julian Hicks on that play, which will be reviewed, went beyond the X's and O's. Incredible route, incredible catch, and for the moment he gives this team a two score lead. This half began with a Poffenberger fumble, but other than that, in a singular moment where maybe he tried to do too much, he has made one perfect throw after another. And really, can you think of a throw that was really in danger off that right hand of his? A couple underthrown balls, sure, but even those plays end up being beneficial because they've got a bunch of PI calls out of those. Yeah, certainly not one that was his fault, uh, for sure. We had that weird pick play here that True. could have been intercepted, but again, that's two guys running the wrong route, so that's not, you don't pin that on the quarterback. But like you said, Andrew, I mean, I, I really think you Albany has a keeper here in Poffenbarger, and he, like you said, He's got a great deep ball. That's probably my biggest takeaway. He's got great touch on the ball, which doesn't come easy to a quarterback necessarily. Great touch, great accuracy today, and he throws a deep ball that's very catchable. When you're a receiver and you want to catch a deep ball, you want the point of the football coming down into your bread basket, basically, right? Not every quarterback is able to do that. He is, and if you're a receiver, I imagine you really like playing with him. And he's been really, really good today, Andrew. And again, please forgive us, we don't have replays in front of us here in the booth. So hopefully you're seeing whether or not this was a catch or not from Julian Hicks. But it was, because here come the PAT units. So that's two Albany touchdowns that stand after review, not necessarily confirmed. And now Opalco for the PAT. And now Albany, a team that hadn't led in its first two games, losses at Baylor and home to New Hampshire, have an 11-point lead on the road here in the Bronx. And this is kind of the next step for the Great Danes here, right? You know, you haven't had a lead all year. Okay, you get a lead. Now you have a lead. Can you keep a lead? And can you keep a lead in another team's house, and not just any other team, a team that's ranked nationally? So this is sort of the next step of the evolution here for the Great Danes. And they're going up against a really good offense who's made a lot of big plays today, but if they can get enough stops, if they can keep moving the ball offensively, they'll be able to hang on. But again, really impressed by this team coming in here today and what they've been able to do and how they've moved the ball up and down the field. I'm granted maybe you can say what you will about the Fordham defense and how they've struggled, and, and that's accurate, but you have to give a lot of credit to this U Albany offense and the throws that Reese Poffenbarger is making just been incredible all day. And they certainly need Todd Sibley to be healthy, but on that last drive between Lopez and Banton, they were okay without their lead running back, who's had a big, big day before a lower body injury. As Opalco kicks off, Coco Suis lets it bounce, and that's into the end zone for a touchback. Well, that was risky. <laughs> I mean, w was there to catch it? Now, the sun is in that direction. I don't know if at the last yeah. minute the sun was a problem, but you are looking in the sun from his vantage point. And you're right, lucky that ball bounced into the end zone correctly because that's a live ball. So now the Fordham offense, high flying through two games, 100 points in beating Wagner and Monmouth, over 700 yards of offense, 35 first downs last week against Monmouth but they have not been clearly that productive, that crisp, especially as of late in this game. Now you've got CCO lined up in the slot here for what, watch for some blocking pick action. On a run, it's Luffridge getting to the outside, getting more blocks from MJ Wright and Julius Luffridge with a big gain on first down, 17 yards to be exact. I like the balance, Andrew, that Kevin Decker is showing, the offensive coordinator. Yes, you're behind, but you don't want to lose the run game. You've got plenty of time to come back in this game. And, you know, Fordham doesn't necessarily care time of possession. They're going to go quick. We've had the conversation with Joe Conlon. 
do you sometimes score too quick that your defense can't catch its breath? They've got time in this game. Yeah. They actually might be beneficial to their defense for an extended drive right here, and they run again on this first down straight ahead for a couple. And I keep lining the tight ends out wide. I'm waiting for them to do some kind of pick action up top here. Quick snap, throwing is Demorat, and MJ White can't make the catch. And again, way back in the first half, Tim Demorat seemed to bang his right hand on something or somebody making a throw. And since then, he has not thrown the ball like he normally does. There's been some underthrows, there's been some wobbly balls. And that one, MJ Wright was open and he just put it in his shins and Wright couldn't make the catch. I I'm sure for him it's probably a pain tolerance issue right now. Or a grip issue. Absolutely. But yeah, we've seen some throws that have just been off. Third and seven after that miss. Pressure comes, Demorak gets it away, but it's incomplete. Makai Felton had two defenders around him. And instead of a long drive to let the defense catch its breath, Fordham's punting, and Demorak, frustrated, comes off the field. Yeah, but there was really nobody open on that play, and I was watching the blocking, they sent the blitz, Julius Luffridge, I think, got away with a hold. But again, another punt. I would caution though, at this part of the field, just be careful for a fake. When you're at midfield and you're in a situation like this. That'd be a gutsy call. Hazlitt kicks the nose of the football up and the fair catch made by Jackson Parker. Albany muffed a punt, gave UNH some easy points last week, ended up losing by five. So Parker gets the assignment today. It had been Brevin Easton back there. He's the one that muffed it last week. Haven't seen him today, and Parker's done a pretty good job so far as U Albany starts from its own 15 yard line. Final minute of an eventful third quarter. U Albany led at the break, but Fordham forced a fumble and on the next play threw for a touchdown to get even. And Andrew, I spy one Todd Sibley in the backfield. Good news for the Great Danes. He's got a long touchdown run and a buzzer beating catch and run to close the opening half. Tony Aitoya blows up that run play. Sibley missed all of their last drive after hurting it looked like a calf on the previous one. He's already asking off the field right now it looks like. It is and I think they're gonna let this run down into the fourth quarter. The U Albany offense. I think that's a smart move given where we're at in the game. Oh, well, let's see here. Now they're gonna. Yeah, they're gonna come back up. He's yeah. he definitely is asking to come off, and then the rest of the offense realize the time situation, and the third quarter is gonna end. But we'll keep an eye on Sibley as we head to the fourth in the Bronx. U Albany 0 and 2, hadn't led before today, and here they are, up 11. And we've got a late flag here, it looks like. The flag came near midfield. The play clock and the game clock were basically identical. So there's no delay of game. The third quarter is over. And it's Albany by 11 here at Fordham.
We have hit the fourth quarter in the Bronx. It begins with Reese Poffenbarger connecting with Roy Alexander. All right, Andrew, you've got a third and four. You Albany does. Imagine this is gonna be a throw. And they've got their one-on-one -on -one matchup that they like. Hicks, at the bottom of your screen. They converted multiple third downs on their last draw, which ended in the end zone. They throw for Hicks, and this one's incomplete. Garrett Williams in coverage. Good, clean coverage. And you all, but he's got a punt. Yeah, and they keep going back to that well so many times, and I would just worry about the fact that they, they run that play a few times today. That one-on-one -on -one with Hicks, the deep ball, not exactly the same play, but different variations of it. Now, I think Fordham's probably looking for that, so now the next step is try to run something else to get him open. Rams are short a man. He just runs on the field now, Pastula, not a great kick, it's short. It checks up, and then one good U Albany bounce. And back out comes the Fordham offense with some work to do. Down 11 with this entire fourth quarter to go. The defense just did its part, and we'll see what Tim DeMorton and company can do when we come back to the Bronx. Tim DeMore out of the Fordham offense back on the field. Down two scores in their home opener on homecoming. A 2-0 start for this program. They have not been 3-0 since 2013. Fotis Coco Sulis, the catch and the move. Fights for an extra yard or two at the end. That's a Fordham first down to midfield. Andrew Coco Sulis is so elusive in the open field. That's why they want to get him the ball as much as they possibly can. He's able to juke out a defender, get a few extra yards, and up to midfield. Demorat now 27 of 43. 300-yard game, three touchdowns. Thinking more, it's Cody, fingertip catch, touchdown! <laughs> Alive and well for the moment in the Bronx. Four more touchdown passes today for Tim DeMorad. The best part of this one, though, is the catch on the end from Cody. It's a great catch from Cody. Another good design by this Fordham offense. 
same concept where they ran that first touchdown to Buron down on the goal line, except they send Cody away on a go route. Demorat fakes the toss, everyone fans out. And now Fordham is going to go for two here to try to make this a three-point game. Now wasting time, trying to get themselves within field goal range immediately. Now they ran the PAT unit out, I think almost by, <laughs> by habit. Yeah. They grab those guys off, and here goes the offense from the left hash. Yeah, which me, me, leads me to think they're going to utilize the right side of the field here. Tight end in motion. Demora keeps it. He's got nowhere to go. A jailbreak in the backfield. Kelly and Missler, the linebackers, flying through to destroy that for U Albany. Well, maybe they should have utilized the right side of the field. And Demorat, two unblocked players. You can't really do uh, too much about that. So they get just the six. It's a five point game as we take a break in the Bronx. A two-point conversion went awry for Fordham. No objection from us with the decision to go for two there, because you, now you know what you need to get the rest of the way on offense, but clearly not the play that Fordham wanted to run there. Yeah, they were trying to run a read option, try to pull the tight end, a little bit of uh, motion deception there, and two guys just came in totally unblocked. Roy Alexander on the return for the Great Danes. A good hit, stays on his feet, almost escaped there. Natani Drotti drilled him, but didn't knock him down. And then Alexander almost recovered to get to the outside and go. And if he did get to the outside, there was nobody there. So that was a big second effort by that Ford of special teams. But now this defense needs to get a stop. You know, we've been talking about them all day, how they struggle stopping the run, how they haven't finished plays or finished tackles. Now, now it's, it's time to put up. And you know, you've got an offense that's moved it up and down the field all day. As a defense, you want to get off the field here, get a stop, give it back to your offense, try to let them take the lead. They got off the field the last time. There still is no Todd Sibley running back for you, Albany. Poffenberger directing traffic. Now he's going to run. He can do this. He's dangerous. And he slides before Ryan Greenhagen, which is a very, very good decision. <laughs> he gets three. Did a lot of running for three yards. Yeah, and he can do this, as you said, Andrew, and they don't really do it enough, I think, you Albany. You know, you can't... They don't even move him around yeah, as no. much as you would think. You would think for sure, especially with how last week ended, all the throws he made on the run, but just has not been part of the game plan. Not sure why. These Great Danes looking for their first win of the year. This is a younger team. 
New players based on transfers. We're gonna close out a win. That's a drop, but there's also a flag. Greeny straight dropped it. But another underthrown ball is gonna to lead to pass interference against Fordham. And Roy Alexander is down for U Albany. Another skill position guy they can't afford to lose. But again, another deep ball, another pass interference. How many times do we see this on a college football Saturday or an NFL Sunday? where you get that deep ball underthrown and it leads to pass interference and you steal however many yards. So we'll take a break for an injured player. Fordham head coach Joe Conlon spent that entire time out. First staring at Bill McKeever, the referee. Yelled at him a little bit, gave an earful to a line judge as well. Then had a chat with McKeever about all the calls against his team. Todd Sibley back on the field, but eaten up by Ryan Greenhagen. I believe they refer to that as working the officials, and Joe Conlon was certainly working the officials in that time out. Talked with them the entire time, as you said. He feels they've been kind of hard done by some of these calls. Maybe he has a point, maybe he doesn't, but he's got to work the officials that's part of his job. And he's really done that today, and we'll see if that wins him any favor as we head down the stretch. Yeah, if I was a coach, and as a fan you feel it, those calls, even right by the rule book, are infuriating. Poffenberger Barger heaves it. The pass is incomplete. He took a hit. There's a flag on the turf for that. There's also an injured offensive lineman. The flag is a hold on you all, but it was Greenhagen, that level Poffenbarger looked clean live. Ryan got up saying that can't be a penalty. It wasn't, it's a hold. It's declined by Fordham to set up third and 11. And there's another injured player and it's Sibley. I said it was an offensive lineman, but it's not. It's Sibley who is blocking, who again is having his lower legs looked at. Yeah, and to be quite honest, he hasn't looked 100% the handful of times he's run the ball or carried the ball since he's uh, come back into the game. So I think if I was the U Albany coaching staff, I think you have to seriously consider does 50% of Todd Sibley amount to greater than your second, your third, your fourth running backs? And right now, I'm just not sure that it does. And so I wouldn't be surprised not to see him for the rest of the game. He got hurt, missed the rest of that drive, and the next one came back out for one play. It was the end of the third quarter, but he was already asking to be out of the next play. Didn't see him until a second ago, went backwards on a run, and then that time again, he goes limping off. So here it goes, third and 11. 
from their own 34. U Albany has lost most of its rhythm on offense. It was up 11, now only five, and backed up here. And again, one deep safety for Fordham, so watch for a shot down the field. Linebackers blitz. Poffenbarger going down the field. He wants Alexander, and he's got nobody. Back-to-back -back forced punts by the Fordham defense. You know what's funny, Andrew? You Albany has had no intermediate passing game the last few drives. I think the whole game has either been legit throws down the field or the jump balls that have led to yeah. some great catches or the PIs. And that's, that's fine if that's your game plan, but you, know, you can't do it for 60 minutes. You know, you can have great plays here and there, but it's not going to be there consistently enough. And a little surprising with Greeny that the middle of the field is not more usable for them. There's a flag back in the line of scrimmage as Cole Thornton fair catches the punt. It's a false start on U Albany. And I think Fordham should think about re-kicking this because that was a really good punt. And I think if you make them do it again, you never know what you can get, right? Pastula is a good punter, don't get me wrong. But you get a block, you get a bad snap. I, I would make them do this again. The ball is at their own 15 yard line. It's an illegal formation. They're just gonna add the five to the end of the kick. But my first thought was yours. That was a good punt. I would make them do it again. But instead, they'll just start a little farther up the field. Down by five with basically 12 whole minutes to work with here. Yeah, and you know, you start, you sort of start getting that feeling of dread if you're a great Danes fan, right? With this Fordham offense coming back on the field, how good they've been all season long. But this defense has gotten some stands today, and so it's, it's time for them to definitely get one here. This Fordham drive begins with Julius Luffridge, the sophomore at running back next to Tim DeMorat. And they call Luffridge's number, he breaks free. Luffridge to midfield. Loses a helmet. Plays dead, plays dead when he loses the helmet. The extra 20 yards or so are gonna come off this for the moment, unless the helmet came off because of a personal foul. You might end up in the same place, but Jimmy's right, when the helmet comes off, the play's gotta be over. Well, that was some visual, wasn't it? His helmet flying off, stiff-arming defenders. The problem is you're supposed to stop playing when the helmet comes off, and I wonder if that's not what the flag is for. That the flag is on him? Possibly, yes. Now, of course, if it came off via a face mask, it would go in the other direction. Now, they've moved the flag up to where all of this began, which is not going to be helpful to us. No. And almost every official is in on this huddle. You have to determine how that helmet came off, as you said, Andrew. But He's once that helmet comes off, you're supposed to stop playing. Which there's also, And there's also a flag back at the 20. And it's all well and good. A Fordham hold sprang the run. Then it's a face mask on the end of it. So this could end up offsetting. Well, the Fordham fans here in the Bronx have not been fans of this crew all afternoon. Penalty is lopsided, but the ones on Fordham were mostly correct calls, deserved calls. Now, did they miss a couple on Albany? Maybe. But there's also been a few of these situations as well, offsetting penalties. And this one ends up hurting Fordham more than Albany. In fact, it really doesn't hurt Albany at all. Trey Sneed's back in. Broke one tackle, but Anthony Lang slings him down for a loss back at the 16 yard line. Andrew, we have not seen a lot of Trey Sneed in this second half. That might even be his first carry of the second half, uh, if memory serves, but they favored Luffridge a little bit more, and he's gotten his. And now it's Sneed out there in this platoon. This is second and 13. 
Play fake, over the middle, off the helmet, in the air, and incomplete. The receiver was covered, the underneath man was in there as well. That was a risky throw from Tim DeMore, and it almost cost him. Yeah, he looked the wrong way. He had DeKeese Carter open at the bottom here on a crosser that would have been worth about 15 yards. Instead, he just stared down his receiver, and he does this from time to time. He just kind of stares down receivers sometimes, and he tried to stare through that window, and it closed on him, and it was very nearly disastrous. The long Luffridge run, now a distant memory. Third and 13 for Fordham. Deep in their own end. Down by five, fourth quarter. DeMort's got time again, going deep again. It's Cody again! All the way to the great game, 30! Wow, what a throw by Tim DeMort. Had that inside post to Garrett Cody. He does a great job breaking free, getting open, and then it's just a throw and catch. DeMorat, a perfect throw. He's had some non-DeMorat throws this afternoon, but that was a beauty. Fifty-one yards through the air to Cody to flip the field. You got Coco Sulis inside slot here. Little screen. Here is Coco Sulis shimmies and gets yanked backwards. Yeah, they'd like to get Coco Sulis involved when they get these three wide receiver stacks, like you just saw at the bottom of your screen. They like to get it to the inside slot receiver. There it was Coco Sulis, a little tunnel screen there, but not much to be had. Just a yard for all of that. So second and nine, clock running, five minutes gone by, fourth quarter. Fordham was down 11, got a touchdown. Missed a two-point conversion. Back to work here. MJ Wright stays on his feet. Pushed out of bounds inside the 20. Andrew, the more I watch MJ Wright, the more I like him. There's a little uh, curl route there. He's able to shake off the defender. Find that spot in the zone. And an easy first down. I think he's had a really, really good game today. Really good start to his season as well. And not surprisingly, Tim DeMorat spreading it around. Wright, Coco Sulis, Carter, Cody, all doing some heavy lifting. DeMorat pulls it back over the middle into the end zone again for a touchdown. Another TD throw to a tight end. It was Buron early. And this is Jaden Allen. They'll go for two here again, but it's a perfect design. Allen's gonna come across the line. He's gonna make it look like he's pulling the block. And then he just leaks out right towards the end zone. Beautiful design by Kevin Decker to spring his tight end wide open. Tim Demorad has had five Six, and now five again touchdown passes in Fordham's three games this season. Going for two, DeMorat, it's a handoff, and it's in the fridge. Once again, there were multiple Great Danes bearing down the Fordham QB. He kept it last time, got steamrolled. This time, Luffridge, the escape hatch, the two-point conversion and a three-point Fordham lead. Good two-point play there. They send Allen like they did before in motion, and he just inserts behind the line of scrimmage, gives them another blocker, and then Luffridge runs behind it. Fordham's got a three-point lead. We'll be right back to the Browns.
Back and forth we have gone. A quick 10-0 Fordham lead. Here in the second half, you already got up 11, but the Rams have scored 14 unanswered to take this three-point lead as Michael Bernard gets set to kick off. Alexander from the six. Fordham's defense has some momentum too here, Jimmy. For a while, they were having a hard time stopping the Great Danes, but now back-to-back -back times forcing punts. And this is kind of like you said it, this is not going to be an elite defense this year. New coordinator, Mark Powell, some older guys about to leave, newer guys working in, somewhat of a transition year. They don't need to be that good. They just need to be good enough. And right now, they've been good enough the last two times on the, on the field. Yeah, they've gotten the stops they needed. And that's kind of what's happened the first couple of games here. And here's another opportunity for them to get a stop. It's also a chance for Reese Poffenbarger to put a quick notch on his resume. And a good gain on first down all the way out to the 39-yard line go the Great Danes. The little dump down to Ian Renninger, their other tight end. Love the call by Jared Ambrose. Get Poffenbarger out of the pocket a little bit. Easy throw to Ambrose. He gets out. He's got room. He gets 15. Beautiful drive starter. Poffenbarger, the quarterback, a redshirt freshman. Just his third collegiate game. He handled a Baylor defense in week one. Almost got a win last week. Now he needs to rally. Gets this one away just in time, and Alexander makes the catch. You know, Andrew, that's the classic example when you're a coach and you're watching that play. You say, no, 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 yes. You got four yards. I mean, that could have been a really big loss for Poffenbarger. He, he took that a little bit too long, but in the end, he made the right decision. He got it to a safety valve. Lived to fight another day. Alicia Armstrong was chasing. Poffenbarger just stayed away from him. And then the arm strength to get that one to Alexander. Pressure coming again. On the move again, Alexander again. I tell you, this kid is showing something special right now. There were two free rushers coming on the backside. Poffenbarger rolls it out, finds his man, perfect throw on the run, and now the Great Danes are in business. Fordham was asking for a hold. Peter Shaluba turned the corner, was bearing down on Poffenberger, thought somebody just grabbed him by the shoulder to slow him down by a half step, but not enough to bring a flag. Back to the air for Poffenberger. He's got time this time, and he's got Greeny inside the 15-yard line. Tiny little adjustment at the end from Greeny to make the catch, and the Great Danes are moving. Yeah, it wasn't very good coverage there by Fordham. He actually had Julian Hicks with a step at the bottom for a touchdown if he wanted it, but Greeny was open too. Poffenbarger kind of wedged that throw in there. And now Fordham's got to get off the field, you have to think, with three, right? You're in the red zone, you got to be able to, whether it's a sack, whatever the case may be, you have to hold it right here. Halfway through the fourth quarter, they were up 11, they're down three, Lopez to the outside, and he can't get there. And a late flag, and a, a U Albany lineman went down and he was asking for the referee for something, so I don't know if that was a, a low kind of blindside block on the defense, but we'll see. It's called on Garrett Williams, an illegal low block. I think Will Murata was the victim. So it's half the distance, another costly penalty against Fordham, and another reason for Joe Conlon to be screaming at the poor line judge <laughs> on the near sideline. The li if I was the line judge, I would just say, look, I didn't call it. Because that flag came in from the other side. So Joe Conlon's going to do what he has to do. I don't blame him for doing that at all. But that one they got right. That was a, a low cut block on, uh, on Garrett Williams. That's Kevin Taylor in the position of hearing Joe Conlon through the hands of Easton. Fastball from Poffenbarger. Mentioned this very quickly the, back in the beginning of the game. Jeff Undercuffler was the Albany quarterback last season. So they've gone from Undercuffler to Poffenbarger because 
two or three syllables wouldn't have been enough. <laughs> we got four from back-to-back -back Albany QBs. And we've got a Fordham player down. That's Alfonso Dixon. It is not super hot today, but it's warm, and there's not much of a breeze. And we've played this entire game in almost full sunshine. So we've had a handful of players dealing with cramps and whatnot, and Dixon's down now being tended to. And as always, Joe Conlon goes on the field to be with his players when they're injured. And think about this defensive line, too, now for Fordham. They've been on the field a lot of the day already without Jonathan Coste. Now, you know, if Dixon is hurt, now you're, you're pretty much out the whole, you know, right side of your defensive line. And that, that would be a loss for Fordham. And they've missed Jonathan Coste today in a number of different ways, whether it be pass rush, stopping the run. They've really missed him. And I'm not going to make excuses for the Fordham defense uh, because there's a lot of things they could do better, but... They have missed Coste, and hopefully for them, they don't have to miss Dixon as he gets up and runs to the huddle. He doesn't even go to the sideline. He gets back in the periphery of the defensive huddle. So that's a good sign. He was chugging water, sitting on the turf. So certainly looked like cramps from up here. Both teams have all three of their timeouts as we get late in this fourth quarter. Fordham coming off a 52-49 win at Monmouth in a 41-38 game, protecting that lead right now. A packed house below us. It's an easy trip for Albany alums in the New York City area, and it's homecoming and the home opener for the Fordham Rams. Wide open is Easton. Can he make a man miss? Starting to the end zone, touchdown! Brevin Easton. With a hurry, gets in the end zone, and you open, he's back on top. Again, another good decision by Poffenbarger. He looked at the top, nobody was there. Looked to his next read, wasn't open. So then he checked it down to Easton, and hey, just get the ball in his hands, he can make a man miss, and that's exactly what he did. And now you Albany back in front. The punter, Pastula, holds. As Opalco puts it through, 45-41, the Great Danes lead again. Didn't have a lead once in their first two games. Down 10-0 today, and this is the third different time now they have been in front. I'm just so impressed by the resilience, you know. It's easy to fold in a situation like this and say, oh, the momentum's against, against you, Albany, and you know, they're not able to get it, but they've just been able to make the plays time and time again. Whenever they've needed it, they have gotten it. And this offense, led by Reese Poffenbarger, really a big reason why. And in particular, that young man has, for the most part, matched one of the best quarterbacks in this division, in FCS, in Tim DeMorat. The raw numbers are not going to line up, but Poffenbarger has made a mistake through three and a half quarters and just let a drive somewhat flawlessly down the field to get back into the end zone and back into the lead. And the thing I care about too, it's not so much the mistakes, how do you respond, right? He made that mistake, they came right back down the field and they got a big drive. And that's really the most important thing. The mistake was the first play of the third quarter. He threw a pass, got deflected to the line, he caught the deflection, started to run with it and fumbled. Coco Sulis from the eight. Coco Sulis has a seam. He has flirted with taking one back. He's come close a couple of times. And a good return here. 44 yard line is where Fordham starts. Time not an issue. 6-11 on the clock. They've got all three of their timeouts. Those don't come into play just yet. Down four. Hey, you know, Andrew, special teams make special teams. And Coco Sulis has been so good on the returns all season long, and another big one there. Maybe get on the ground with Sneed. He's got room straight ahead. Trey Sneed down the middle. And inside the Great Dane 30. Great seal by the Fordham offensive line. And Sneed hits the hole about as hard as anyone you'll see. And now when he gets to that second level, not juking away from the contact, but rather inviting it. 
He ran right at Jacob Hargraves. Demorat airmails one, and MJ Wright slips. Forget that one, move on to second down. You know, that throw might have been gone even if Wright kept his feet. And I thought he might have had a chance with Coco Sulis down the field. You, you don't want to take a risk in this part of the field, so I understand that. But he had a one-on-one. -on -one. I thought he might have been able to throw it up there. But instead, uh, he went for the check down. It wasn't uh, an accurate throw, and Wright lost his feet anyway. Here they're going to line up Allen at the bottom with Carter in the slot. See if there's any pick action between those two. Albany blitzes, DeMora at a wobbler, Coco Sulis goes and gets it! Bookend pressure on the Fordham quarterback, floated one, and Coco Sulis snatched it. Yeah, I don't know if DeMora got hit or if that was tipped or whatever the case may be, but that's your receiver just going and making a play. Coco Sulis, phenomenal. Back to Sneed, a cutback, dips that shoulder again, and he's inside the 10. Again, the only bad news for Fordham, it's taken them just a minute to get inside the UAlbany 10-yard line. They love Coco Sulis down here in the red zone, this part of the field. They're motioning him down now. But he is the go-to read for DeMorad if they throw it. It's Snead. He's got some room to the outside, to the end zone. And back in the lead for the Rams. Andrew, this is crazy. And they just keep going back and forth and back and forth. Great blocking by the right side of that Fordham offensive line opened up a huge hole for Snead. And as he very capably often does, he takes care of the rest. It's crazy, except that Fordham saw this seven days ago <laughs> at Monmouth when they won 52-49. Important extra point, and it's good for a full three-point lead from Brandon Peskin. And you think about it too, the game flow from that Monmouth game is kind of similar to this one. Fordham got down a couple of scores in that second half. Their offense came back. They wound up scoring on a late drive, but now it's back to you, Albany. And can they keep going pound for pound with this Fordham offense, which is really one of the best in the country? I mean, been scoring 50 points per game, that average might go down if the score holds, <laughs> which is wild. But, you know, can they keep trading blows with this Fordham offense? Remains to be seen, but they've been really good so far. That's their first non-passing touchdown today. Sneed gets it, and I chuckled. Jimmy's not kidding, though. Fordham scored 100 points over its first two games, so averaging an even 50, 48. Get it together. It's going to bring that down. So they're off their pace, but they've got the lead again. Multiple leads for both teams. This one has been nuts, which is saying a lot, coming off of, again, a 52-49 thrill that went down the very last play, a Monmouth path, pass knocked down at the goal line. Alexander from the two this time. A flag from behind, Alexander to the 20. Yeah, Albany's gonna end up starting this drive inside their own 10. This is a hold on one of the Great Danes, but it happened around the 15 yard line. The hold is on Ian Renninger, the backup tight end. So a long field for Reese Poffenbarger and this UAlbany offense looking for their first win of the season. And right now you want to emphasize, if you're UAlbany, no negative plays, no silly penalties. You want a play here that's going to start your drive. Doesn't have to be a first down, doesn't have to be a huge gain but a play that can start your drive in the right direction. So I would maybe look for another short throw here for Poffenbarger. Todd Sibley, who seems to have been battling cramps all this second half, is on the field for this first play. 
Poffenbarger throwing with time out of his own end zone. Stephen Williams almost got it. Instead, it's Alexander running free and out of bounds, far side of the 40. There is a flag, though. Back in the line of scrimmage, and Albany's reacting like it's on them for the moment. And it's not. It's a hold on Mike Courtney. Albany began walking backwards, shrugging their shoulder, going, who me, what did I do? But it's another penalty on Fordham. The play stands, the play counts, out to the 43. And another pinpoint throw from Poffenbarger. Hit his receiver in stride, and these receivers have been really good today. Julian Hicks. Did he hang on to that? He did. Excuse me, it's Zenoble against Gary Williams. Two plays into Fordham territory now for the Great Danes. I mean, these receivers are incredible for you, Albany. The plays that they have made today, pinpointing the ball on these back shoulder throws, absolutely incredible. They got that one on one with Zenoble. I thought it was defended well, but there's no defense for a throw and catch like that. I don't think that they have dropped a catchable ball today. I think you're right. Sibley cut down quickly by Conway in the flat. The only balls that have not stuck in those hands for them have been a couple underthrown balls, maybe a miss here and there, but their success rate in the air, draped in coverage, is through the roof this afternoon. And now is when you start looking at the clock. You're down to 3.38 to go as we look at the clock on our left side here. Second and nine, they're not in field goal range yet. Quick hitter, East in a catch. Greenhagen and Williams the tackle, but UAlbany is moving again, now the 35 yard line. And, and I, if I was them, I would start to try running it down a little bit. Now you wanna hit that balance between running the clock down and staying in your rhythm. From here, I think you have two plays. I think they're gonna tell Poff and Barger that. He knows that. Given the situation, it's probably not field goal range, as you said, Andrew. But uh, there's a little confusion here by the Great Danes. They're not exactly sure where they're going to line up. Nobody is sure. Poffenbarger stopping motion now. I, mean, I, would, I would just call timeout if I was them. I mean, nobody knows what's going on. Play clock's at four. Yeah. And now they finally call it. It got louder and louder here. And for the first time this afternoon, this UAlbany offense, new coordinator, freshman quarterback, some new faces. They are finally look a little bit rattled here. They look like they're new to each other. And they look confused. You know, there was some doubt, okay, we got four wide receivers. Where do we line up? Is it three stacked to the top, one at the bottom? Is it two wide? Is it spread? What are we looking at here? And, you know, Andrew, as you said, a lot of new players. They're still learning the scheme. And sometimes that, that takes a little time and for the most part today they've been excellent there was a little confusion I think it's a good time out by Jerry Gattuso and uh, Greg Gattuso I beg your pardon and you know look you got to get your team together so you take the time out it's third and five again you've got two plays so you know you don't have to get it all right here as loud as possible here in the Bronx on third down Fordham almost jumped play clocks at three Play clock's at one. They just get it off. Here comes the pressure, and it's incomplete. Fourth down for U Albany. It'd be a 52-yard field goal. Yeah, I don't think this is in range for John Opalco. His long of the year is 36. Could you kick it? Yes, because it's in the middle of the field, but I think that's the right call. And this is what a home field advantage can do for you. Listen to this. Fourth and five, down three for you, Albany. Rams bring a blitz. Poppin' Parker heals it, and it is broken up. Tight coverage again. Another jump ball, but this one not caught. No flag either. Nasir McNair was in coverage. Great coverage by McNair, Andrew, and this, as I said about this crowd, it did really scramble things for you, Albany, offensively. That offensive line 
It was all out of sorts, those last two plays. And free rushers coming in, Poppenbarger just had to launch it. Didn't even see where he was throwing it. And now for Fordham, you get one first down, and you can get out of here with a victory. Oh, but he's got two timeouts left, 2.39 on the clock. Protecting a three-point lead on the ground with Luffridge. There's the first Albany timeout, 2.31 on the clock. All right, so Luffridge got five, and he's kind of been the back of choice today as the game has gone on for Fordham. You get five on first down, you all these down to one timeout. So that timeout they had to use on the third down now really comes into play because that's an extra 40 seconds that's gonna go off the clock. So now for Fordham, I think you just run it again. And look, like I said, if they get a first down, this game's over, basically. So Fordham's in good shape here. I think you just keep it on the ground again. And this U Albany defense, I mean, they, they got a few stops, but when they needed it, they weren't quite able to get it. They were out there a lot. And now I think that's starting to show. And the Fordham defense, again, the points on the scoreboard allowed some of the other Numbers for this U Albany offense are not going to look good on paper, but at the moment they've made the big plays here down the stretch to get this one almost to the finish line. Luffridge is going to be a yard short. Albany's timeout, their last one gets called right now. All right, so we got a third and one here, and you have to think Albany's going to stack the box. I wouldn't put it past Fordham to put it into Morat's hands on a read. Because you know you know you Albany's gonna put seven, eight in the box to try to stop this third down, and it's almost certainly gonna be a run. But I would not, as I said, put it out of Fordham's hands, or beyond Fordham, I should say, to give it to Tim Demorat on a read and let him get around the corner and finish this one off. Interesting again, it's Luffridge and not Sneed. I'm feeling more straight handoff here. Just eliminate the extra degree of difficulty well, that's a very good point of the too, putting yeah. it in and taking it out for DeMorat. Just give it a Luffridge to see what happens. A first down, and this one's over. There's the handoff. Luffridge is close. A push backwards at the end by U Albany. One last Fordham push, and that's a first down. The official signal there for the first down, all but guarantees the Rams win in a back and forth affair. They can get this one to the finish line as we inch towards the two minute mark here in the Bronx. Gritty run by Luffridge and a gritty win here today by the Rams. Wasn't always pretty, definitely was not always perfect, but when it all came said and done, they got it done. And that's what you got to do. Thanks to our crew led by Matt Mendez and David Bernard Santana. Our thanks to our new friend Greg up here in the booth. Now let me ask you this. Why would Fordham run it on that play instead of just taking the knee? Because if you do the math, you already can't stop it. The next play is going to be inside of 120. Now you got an offensive lineman hurt. I think you could just kneel it down. I, I don't think you need to, to run it anymore. Two things. They're almost never under center. Well, that's true. And I wonder if DeMorat, if that right hand is preventing him from getting under center to take a snap, yeah. that this is a little safer. But you could still you could still kneel it down from shotgun or pistol. You could. Mm. They'll run it again. And Ruffridge. Wants as many yards as possible. Strong showing from him. Trey Sneed did some work as well. Not as crisp as it has been through the air, but another five touchdown day for Tim Demorat. Four different receivers. And the defense gives up 45 points but makes a couple of stands here late in this game. And Fordham's about to be 3-0 for the first time in nine years. Two hands on the ball if he runs it. Yep. He runs it, he sits down, he takes one last hit. And now the Rams in the Bronx.
can celebrate that 3-0 start. Up 10 early, down 11 in this second half. They win another shootout, 48-45. Conlon and Gattuso, the handshake in midfield. And the Rams again, 3-0 for the first time since 2013. And for you, Albany, they are still not in the business of moral victories, but hard fought, another close call for them. You can see the progression. You can see where they're going with Poffenbarger. They're almost there, but for them, it's three for three this year. I would even dare to say, I think you, Albany is probably going to be a good team by the end of the season. But again, it's just week to week with these young players. And for Fordham, hey, wasn't pretty, but they got it done. And now they're 3-0. And thanks again to our crew and to you for joining us. It's a Fordham win, a happy homecoming here in the Bronx. 48-45 is the final. For that great crew and my partner, Jimmy Sullivan, I'm Andrew Bogus. Thanks for watching Fordham Football. How do we have stats? Who's giving us stats?